Hello again, friends! And you are our friends. Happy holidays to you, and welcome back to another edition of Jim Cornette's Drive Through right here on another. It's not winter yet. Another late fall day. It should be winter. I think once you hit December, it's winter. But I'm your host, the great Brian Last, and here with me, a man, I guess late summer, right? Technically, you're not the fall yet, Mr. Jim Cornette. Oh, for God's sake, you meteorological moron. <laughs> Very good that getting sh- that out. <laughs> that should have been a Dr. Smith. <laughs> you bubble-headed booby i don't know now i don't know what where the fuck we're at where it's not winter yet but it's colder than a witch's tit and we've sure got spring tornado weather recently but yet then uh, uh yesterday it was 60 something degrees i don't know what the fuck's going on. i went to the post office uh, yesterday morning it was 29 degrees frost on the vehicles and then it got up to the 60s. We just finished the tornadoes. Maybe a blizzard. Well, from what I hear from Turner Network Television, winter is coming. So maybe that has something to do with it. How's your weather, asshole? Uh, you know, it's cold, but it's sunny. And then it's getting into, like, the late 40s, early 50s. Low, late 40s, early 50s. I, I <laughs> the high 40s. I remember when 50s. I was getting into my late 40s. And early 50s. Oh, it's not too We're bad. really going to try to do this show today. All right. I don't. First of all, it's late. I don't mean the time of day. I mean, the show is late. Imagine there's news, but this is my fault. Uh, I tweeted out yesterday. We, we were going to record this program yesterday. And I tweeted out that uh, literally less than an hour before we were scheduled to start recording, um, we found out that Stacey's mother is going to have to have another fairly major surgery. Um, And for the folks who have been following the show, she had open heart surgery back the early part of November, and Stace was out there for that. And the doctor said she did very well, but at the same time, they kept her in the hospital for t- until the day after Thanksgiving, I think it was, or the weekend of, or whatever, just to make sure of everything. And then she's been home for a little while. Well, then she had to go back to the hospital last week, late, I guess, because she, without going through her whole medical file, she had fluid in her lungs. It was, again, trouble breathing, but you're mostly in the bed after surgery, et cetera, like that. So in trying to alleviate that, they found out, I guess, day before yesterday, that she had an infection that may have been causing that, and they were trying to treat it with antibiotics. And then yesterday morning, uh, suddenly she's in a hospital closer to where she lives in the San Francisco area, they just told her, oh, well, we're going to send you back to the to the hospital that you had your heart surgery, and we're going to do another fairly major procedure to uh, in the same area to deal with this infection. And this, well, well when is this going to happen? Oh, like today. Now, you know, pack your shit, right? It's like they're sliding down the fireman's pole and jumping into the fire engine over this. They transport her to the other hospital and i called you brian i said well we want to you know we're standing by here on this blah 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 let's maybe not record this today and then as soon as they get her over to the other hospital in san francisco they say oh we're, we're not actually doing it today what that's like sliding down the pole and getting on the fire engine and then finding out the fire's not going to start until tomorrow why were we rushing and everybody got all fired up about this but They want to do some preparatory stuff or whatever, and so that's going on later on today as we record this, which is earlier in the day than normal. Uh, So we don't have any updates, but I appreciate everybody. You know, after I tweeted that uh, we were standing by as a result of that, a lot of people tweeted well wishes. We appreciate that. And that's what we know so far. And also, we appreciate everybody that uh, had asked about us over the weekend when, again, of uh, major parts of Kentucky and I guess Illinois and some place in was it geez was it Arkansas whatever about got wiped out in Tennessee you know I always said that I was 
I would never want to live in a place where they had hurricanes because I'm like, fuck, uh, you know, that is, that's some scary shit and it happens with frequency, but this shit's happening with more frequency in the middle of the country too. So I guess there's no place you can be safe, Brian. But uh, but everybody was checking on us. We the the Louisville area. I'll get to the meat of my story in a second. But the Louisville area was okay. It was the uh, western part of the state. Mayfield, Kentucky, just got hammered, and that's out near Paducah and the western uh, Western Kentucky. But there was also a tornado down in Dawson Springs uh, in central Kentucky. I ring announced a. Uh, a spot show for Christine Jarrett there one time. And um, I said the Louisville area didn't get, we got hammered with like two to three inches of rain overnight and a short period of a few hours and the high winds and the thunderstorms and the fucking bullshit. But the closest tornado was about as the crow flies, as they say about 40 miles from here was only an F one. So 40 miles from here, they had, I think, 105 mile an hour winds. But within 100 miles of us, we had an F1, an F2, and an F3. And I was, Friday night, they were calling for the severe weather to come. And then they obviously, they get in the, uh, they stay on the air, right? The weather people. I watch my WDRB weather guys. They stay on the air when there's, bad shit going on and preempt the regular programming and they had signed off you know and gone back to regular programming about midnight after they'd given the update but i'm still i'm gonna stay up right and watch this shit stace took harley to the other end of the house the thunder was driving her nuts and i'm gonna sit up and watch the tv because i'm nervous about these things because the scariest moment when i was a kid probably was april 3rd 1974 and that was back in the days when they didn't have all this color weather radar on tv and all this shit they just say okay there's a tornado about 40 miles from here get in your crawl space for the next three hours and that's all you knew right you got to take the battery operated radio to the crawl space but the we were the entire Southeast was just hammered. Xenia, Ohio was wiped off the face of the map and Brandenburg, Kentucky got slammed and it was a historic day of outbreaks for tornadoes back then. And my mom and I were in the crawl space, right? And it didn't, you know, hit near here, but 30 years later, April 3rd, 2004, we did an OVW TV taping and naturally on the 30th anniversary, had to have a Texas tornado match, right? So we all four guys in the ring. And I'm doing the commentary with Dean Hill. Did you ever meet Dean when you came to the gardens that time? Did you meet Dean? No, I didn't meet him. He just pointed out where I was to a few thousand angry people. To people that wanted to kill you and your friends, yes. yes. Well, anyway, um, well, Dean was doing the color with me, I, you know, the commentary on the OVW show. And I brought up, you know, it's tornado day and, and I asked what I thought was an innocent question to my broadcast partner, but then I realized too late that Dean's other job, besides being a wrestling announcer, he had been a Louisville City police officer. for. He retired after like 25 years. He was one of the first members of the SWAT team. He'd done all kinds of shit, right? I said, Dean, where were you on April 3rd, 1974? And he came back with something like, well, I was picking through a wrecked house down at 6th and Shelby looking for dead bodies. And I was just hoping at that point, I hope everybody remembers, Dean, you were a cop, because else why that <laughs> But anyway, um The missing hookers of Louisville. Where were yeah, they? Yeah, yeah. So so anyway, I was sitting up watching TV and I'm about to nod off, because I gotta be at the post office Saturday morning at eight o'clock, right? And I'm about to nod off and they come back on and they say, Well, we're watching something, folks. And that was this fucking tornado that was on the ground. That's what happened, the big one, in Mayfield. And it tornadoes don't usually stay on the ground for a long distance, right? They, they form and they dissipate and they go up off the ground and down and they do all kinds of weird things. As a matter of fact, another thing that Dean told me, 
looking through one of the houses, he walked in this old woman's house that collected these ceramic figurines, right? The little two, three inch tall figurines. You know what I'm talking about. And, and they were arranged on this shelving thing in her house on one side of her living room. And not only was not one of those figurines turned over, but when he picked one up to look, there were still dust rings around it where she hadn't dusted recently. That was on one side of the living room. On the other side of the living room, the way he walked in her house was she had no front wall. It was gone. So they, 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 we've been seeing pictures on the news of refrigerators stuck in trees 15 feet up in the air. And, you know, they did those strange things with cars. They end up in strange places. But this fucking tornado was staying on the ground. And it, it, they're covering this on the news, and the, the path, the trajectory is straight toward metropolitan Louisville with over a million people, right? And that was the, I think they're inspecting or, you know, trying to check and see, was it an F5? Was it an F4? It was stronger in some points than it was in others. They've even got one of the people here in Kentucky now that invented the f scale or help develop it trying to figure out what the fuck happened here because this tornado was on the ground for like 150 fucking miles or whatever and that is either an all-time record or if they can verify that it was the same one then it's at it's, it's least in a hundred years this hasn't happened it's not and it we're not supposed to have tornadoes in december anyway because we're not supposed to have weather as warm as it's been in various places so all this shit was fucked up. So anyway, it goes past four o'clock, I guess, in the morning. And, and, we're, and this thing has got to where it's still on the map and it's like 60 miles from downtown Louisville and closing in. And they're like, we're, uh, we're going to start asking everybody in Louisville to go to your spot if uh, this does not dissipate. And then long about, I don't know, it's 4.30 or 5 o'clock. I'm fucking fried at that point. I don't know what the fuck I'm doing, keeping an eye on all this shit. They said it seems to be breaking up. So the closest we got was the tornado was in Mount Washington. And then, you know, the, the most of the storm has passed by. We heard the thunder and the wind and the blah, blah, blah. But it's dark. So I nod off. I'm thinking, okay, the, the danger has passed. I nod off for about an hour and a half, two hours, and then get up because I got to go to the post office. And I look out the side window, side of the bedroom there, and there's not a thing out of place. And I look out the back window. I can see almost the whole backyard. Not a thing out of place, Brian. There's a, it may be a, a seat cushion from one of the yard chairs that's blown over. Nothing in my neighbor's yard, nothing in the back, nothing in the other neighbor's yard on the other side that I can see. You almost want to, you know, it's like the calm after the storm, right? And so I think, well, whew, boy, it's not like a thing where you come out of the bunker, right? And there's devastation everywhere and you're thanking God you're alive. It's like, well, this completely passed by us, right? How lucky can we be? And then I walk down in the kitchen and look out the front window. <sighs> Brian, it's a rib from the cosmos on me. <laughs> there are two things in this, on this property that could not be replaced, that cannot be insured, that cannot be paid for or repaired or whatever. Right? The house... I ain't lying. If a tornado picked the house up and dropped it on a wicked witch over in Oz, I would be very, very put out. But it's also insured to the point where I would be fucking put out in Honolulu on the beach, right? But there's some things you can insure and you can't replace. Many people see that every year I tweet pictures of two trees in the very middle of my front yard. One of them is the dogwood, and don't anybody's sphincter pucker, the dogwood's okay. 
But the other one is the giant, majestic, 45-foot-tall cedar tree that I planted myself with my little kitty shovel when I was about seven years old. And all through these years, that thing has grown and grown. And all through these years, that thing has, has as I said, grown to 45 feet high. And that, when I looked out in the front yard, that was me and my, because my mom planted the dogwood. There's me and my mom standing there looking out over the property, right? Well, that 45-foot cedar is now an 18-foot twig that looks like the Charlie Brown Christmas tree. But not only this, Brian, and not only this would be a rib, but you know, and I've mentioned some of it on the program here, all the stonework that the Monroe brothers did at the property this past year, and the centerpiece of all of that, and the most involved piece, was two rings, two creekstone retaining walls ringing the dogwood and the cedar, joined in the middle by a creek, custom creekstone bench that you can sit on under the shade of those trees. And some of the stones featured in that were stones that were left over from when my dad built the original part of the house here in the 1950s so that I could sit on my father's stones while I was under mine and my mother's tree. So yes, last fall I spent $12,000 to decorate these trees. It is now an 18-foot twig with branches on one side and 75% of it is gone. Not only that, Brian, I'm not sure if you're aware of this, but these two trees right in the middle there, right next to the bench, is my final resting place. I don't know if I've told you that or not. I did not know that, no. And uh, I don't mean, there is a statute, you can't be buried in your front yard around here, right? It's something to do with, I don't know, the sewage or something. But you can be cremated and sprinkled. My plan is half of me is going in a plot next to my mom and dad. And then there's, there's, there's room next door for Stace. If she so desires when she, I, I have a, I would imagine just by the chronological order of things, she'll need that after I do. Um, and half of me goes under the tree here, right next to Harley. Cause that's her favorite spot to sit too. So, not only did I spend $12,000 to decorate a tree that had lasted for over 50 years, every storm we ever had, and it didn't make it six months after I spent that money, but it's also <laughs> disfigured mine and my dog's final resting place. So you can see how put out I was. And somebody on Twitter said, well, goddamn, Cornette, a bunch of people lost their lives and property and blah, 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 and you're upset about a tree? I have already mentioned that I'm upset about the whole thing, and I certainly feel for the people that lost lives and family and or property. But if I walked into your house, Brian, and pulled a picture of your mother off the wall and wiped my dirty ass with it, just because there's people still starving in Bolivia, does that mean you still wouldn't be pissed off? Depends on which picture, but uh, I get your point. Yeah, there's a point there. It's it's a cosmic rib on Cornette. The one the, I, I got seventy five trees in the back there that you know pick one if you want to take one. Hadn't decorated any of them. Hadn't made plans for the hereafter uh, to, for me to be put under the poplar tree. The deer would eat my remains. So that was fun. <laughs> the deer would eat your remains? <laughs> That's how you ended the story? Well, I said I don't want to be sprinkled under the poplar tree because that's where the, we, I feed the deer and the deer would eat my remains. 
what, be- I guess what they better could tribute? Put me in the- what better tribute to the deer? Well, they could put me, they could sprinkle me in the creek and I could just meander down through the neighbor's yard and into the fucking creek down the road. Apparently, so bo- then, apparently bone meal is really good for gardening. Well, see, I'm trying to help take care of the environment. So did I mention this to you? I don't even know whether I did or not. After, after of course, I had to call Corky and Corky came over and took old greeny away most of it you know i'm not cutting the rest of it down and see that's another thing i've just spent a lot of money on decorating this yard this was the centerpiece i'm about to spend more money on decorating various things and now i have to live with an 18 foot twig for the rest of my life or cut it all down and i'll never cut it all down even if it dies i'm leaving the stalk such as it is so i'm i'm going to be sitting there looking at that for the rest of my life have you talked to or have the Monroe brothers been there? Have they seen this? The Monroe brothers came out the very next day because they were they were going to come Saturday and Sunday and work on leaves, but the Saturday it was too soggy. They came Sunday, and as soon as they said, they went into fucking shock because they were out there for three weeks doing that shit. And they're like, what the fuck? They've, they've seen the curse. Something's going to happen around here. At some point, no matter what we do to prevent it. but And and oh, and this is what I was going to tell you the rest of it. So Monday, to put ourselves in a little bit better mood, um, I don't know if I've mentioned this. I'm buying Stace a car for Christmas. I get her a new car every 10 years, whether she needs one or not. And it's been exactly 10 years. So she's picked out what she wanted. and. We go over to the dealership. We've already made contact with the salesman. So now we're going in for the official. You got to order it because it's it comes with all the bells and whistles and it's got special trim and whatever the fuck and the color and blah, blah, blah. So he sits down. He puts all this together. She answers all the questions. He says, well, right now I'm going to go over there and I'm going to order this car. It's only going to take me a few minutes. I'll come back with a printout and, and they'll get started. It's going to be six to 10 weeks on this, but we'll just order this thing right now. I said, Oh, cause last time the last car I got her, that was when she wanted a certain kind of paint and the tsunami in Japan had wiped out the paint factory and she couldn't get the paint at all. And then the other stuff she went, took like three or four months. Don't come back with bad news. Oh no, we're going to, I'm going to go order this thing and it's good. We're going to get the order in. I'll come right back to you. So he goes over there. We're sitting there for a little while, sitting there for a little while. His definition of right back is different than mine. And he comes back and guess what he said, Brian? He said, well, I got some bad news. I said, no, now I think he's ribbing us, right? Because I've just said this thing. He said, "Uh, we can't order it. I said, why not? He said, the internet's down. Spectrum? What? Yeah. Was it Spectrum? <laughs> I did. I, I assume it's the only internet in fucking town. I said, you got to be ripped. He said, no. When he gets on the site where they put the thing in and order the, the cars from wherever the fucking North Pole of cars is, Santa's workshop there in Dearborn, Michigan, or wherever the fuck, you get the, the little wheelie thing, the circle in the middle. It just keeps going around and around. They can't connect to it. He said, I've got all the information. It 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 should come back today. I'll enter it. I'll I'll call, I'll let y'all know. But it no, I the first time I've got this is as far away as I've been in public. It was 10 whole miles from the house. I I go 10 whole miles from the fucking house and sit in a public place wearing a mask with my hands in my pockets, but still. And the internet's down. To order a brand new car. Top that one. Well, we could try to top the story with stories of the derelicts in and around professional wrestling. And oh wait, I got more. And- I got more. No, no, we're not going to wrestling yet. We're go. We're going to the to the cult of cornet listeners and the people out there that have money with cornets collectibles. That's where we're going. They've got money invested in this. I'll have you people know you fine fine people out there that, with the following exceptions that I will enumerate. Everything that you people ordered from me the first week of October is officially in the mail. 
you've either gotten it or it's on the way for, for some of you. Most of you have gotten your stuff. None of you that have emailed me asking where your stuff is have gotten an answer the last two or three weeks, three weeks because I just didn't fucking know and was too busy trying to get it all out to figure it out. But now that everything is out, it's, it's going to be nut cutting time real soon. We're going to find out because I, there are about, I don't know, half a dozen, maybe eight people who apparently do not know exactly where they live and gave me a an incorrect address and your shit's been kicked back and I'm going to be getting a hold of you. Hotchkiss is coming to help me. And uh, there are about, unfortunately, the Australia and New Zealand situation is bleak again because Bree got the word they were accepting first-class mail again, but that is legitimately like a first-class letter or a flat envelope anything they can't get on at the post office they can't connect to the custom site for australia and new zealand to do those so they're not accepting anything except express mail which as we mentioned just for one figure i think it's like 85 dollars. so for about 30 of you folks in australia and new zealand your stuff is signed packed up and ready but now once again with the help of the the magical and lyrical Hotchkiss Featherbottom. I'm going to email everybody and dis and let them tell me whether they want their money back or they want me to hold this for the all clear and still send it to them. And so except for the people who don't know where they live and the people, unfortunately, down under, everybody soon will have their shit. And a couple of people have written me saying that I spelled their name wrong and I'm going to take care of that too. So have patience. If you've written me with a complaint, you'll, you'll hear by, it'll be a Christmas miracle. You'll hear by Christmas. Oh, I don't know whether I'm up to do this again or not. We got some cool merchandise plans, but I don't know whether the loose nut behind the wheel can keep driving this train. This was a challenging one. And the cameos, a thank you, Christmas cameo chaos. It, it we we sold a hundred cameos basically in about six hours. And with all the other stuff going on this week, uh, we figured that's as many as we can fill, and we're going to be filling those on uh, Thursday and Friday this week, which means nothing to the people that are listening to this three months after we record it. But if you ordered a cameo this past weekend. During Christmas cameo chaos, those are coming very shortly. I don't know what else to do. This is your show. This is my show, and maybe something you could do is... Trade lives with me. Wait a minute, you got children. Yeah. I don't want to make any hasty comments. I don't know where you were going. What was I that? I started. I said, "Trade lives with me." Wait and a then minute. you said you have children. I don't Wait want to make a minute. hasty You've got comments. children. I don't want to make any hasty comments there. No matter what happens, at, at least Harley's the only pitter-patter of little feet that I'm hearing running around the castle. Well, you see, what you may not understand is one You're of the, a more energetic individual than I am. I have a bit of energy, but one of the things that helps with kids is bribery. And <laughs> all the kids want the brand new Ray Con earbuds. Well, yes. I <laughs> sneak attack. Thank you for that sneak attack. And... Uh, I don't know, with children, I prefer intimidation instead of bribery, but we'll see what happens. But I'll tell you what, folks, don't be intimidated. Do not be intimidated when choosing your earbuds. We know that you have a choice in earbuds, and frankly, some of the premium audio brands just suck because they're way too expensive. Yeah. The Raycon wireless earbuds are half the price. They start at half the price of other premium audio brands, but they sound even better. Holy mackerel, you get three sound profiles to make sure that everything you're listening to sounds its best with just the right amount of bass or trout or crappie, bluegill, Base. flounder, whatever kind of fish you're into. You've got the pure mode for podcast listening, blues and instrumentals, balanced mode for rock and heavy metal, the bass mode, if you don't like bass, the bass mode for hip-hop and EDM, whatever that may be. And Reggie, don't forget about Reggie. Electronic dance music. On the, 
I'm sorry? Electronic dance music. That too. You can listen to that if you can find it. Raycons are available in five stylish colors. So you can pick a perfect one for everyone. I don't have the colors listed here. Do they have unicorn vomit? They do not. That is right they now, I believe, a proprietary of WWE. NXT. Okay. But, folks, they're, they're, they're gifts for moms, gifts for guys, gifts for your neighbor's cousin's dog. You know, I put spot remover on my neighbor's cousin's dog and he disappeared. You can study all the gift guides and shop at 10 different places, or you can just start and end your shopping at Raycon and get a gift for everybody with the Raycon wireless earbuds. And right now, all of you fine folks out there will get 15% off site-wide at buyraycon.com. That's B-U-Y-R-A-Y-C-O-N, buyraycon.com slash J-C-E when you use the code HOLIDAY. Holiday is the code with one L, just in case anybody's interested. It's a special deal. 15% off the entire order by Raycon.com slash JCE. Use the code HOLIDAY. Because that's what, it's a holiday from high prices, Brian. That's right. Raycon kicks the shit out of high prices. That's right. And then buries it in an unmarked grave somewhere in a state park. Why a state park? Well, just, you know, out there in the woods. Yeah, but it doesn't have to be a government entity. Why a state park? Well, fuck, you don't want to be just dropping bodies on somebody's private property. Give it to the fucking city. Let them worry about it. Okay. I was just thinking you may want to go into property that you don't know who owns it and just do it there. But if you want to go to state or (laughs) government-owned property to bury your bodies, who am I to tell you not to do that? What about the Meadowlands? Put him up there with Jimmy Hoffa. We'll bury those high prices right next to the head of the Teamsters underneath Giants Stadium. All right, well, let's see how we can bury the rest of this show here today. We have a lot to talk about. We have questions, major issues happening all over the world of professional wrestling, and even, I guess, some reviews. Originally, we weren't going to review Rampage this week, but then there was a debut. I watched it almost live, a few minutes behind. And I told you I thought you needed to watch it. Everyone went crazy (laughs) for it. So we ended up watching most of Rampage, at least, correct? Well, yes, because I was going to watch one match, and then you made me watch another one. So I ended up watching two. But uh, the one you were speaking of, of course, was the the long-awaited debut. They sent Hook in. Hook came in to save the day. The wrestling debut of Taz's son, Hook. And... (laughs) I'm thinking, you know, they they introduce Sting, the man they call Sting, or the man they call Vader, or whatever the far as some preamble to some of these one word name guys, right? I'm wondering if they should here comes Hook. Like you remember the Daredevil comics, the Marvel comics, Daredevil, here comes Daredevil, the man without fear. It could be here comes Hook, the man with weird hair. What did they say? They did say like this is Hook or they said something. Well, they could say something else, is what I'm saying. See his a lot hair, of people saying that. His hair and Jamie Hayter's hair. You watch them come to the ring and it bounces up and down. It puts you in a trance. This hair is going to be the most over hair in the wrestling business. His, the, it, I think people have called it unfortunate in the past, an unfortunate head of hair or just weird or whatever, but the hair fits him perfectly. Uh, his opponent was Fago Del Solo from Mobile, Alabama, the luchador from Mobile, Alabama. Um, so obviously they they wanted somebody that's athletic enough to do his shit and at the same time small enough that he could move him around and, you know, whatever. But uh, the the spotlight was on hook here. And I love this fucking kid. Because before we have not seen him do enough to know whether he could do anything or not. And it kind of, you know, was like just the, the rib and there's hook standing there doing nothing, but fuck, he's in great shape. Uh, but more importantly, he's got attitude, the, the facial expressions and the way he comes off, you know, when he's fucking healing the people and he was heelish in his, demeanor already you know he's got some natural things you can i know taz has been obviously i'm sure training enemies been training with a i'm sure a bunch of different people 
but he's got shit you can't really teach if his personality was a bag of wet fucking lettuce and he just carried himself really good and he went especially when he knew he was getting over and he knew he was doing well he got a little extra of you know oomph in his a little hitch in his get along there but he does the judo throws he's smooth with it he's got a different kind of style than just everybody else and a lot of it is his aggression even though he's green he was aggressive and he wasn't out there scared to say boo to a goose as adrian street would say um and then finally he foiled old fago's tornado ddt hit him with a clothesline hit him with that that's a i don't know what they call it but it's the tazplex thing that taz used to use right where he traps the kind of like a cobra sleeper and takes him over his head the taz mission no that wasn't the taz mission it was something else that was Ta- the taz tazplex he was tasmified the- yes he was tasmified um he needs he needs work on those cross faces because the as he stood over the guy and started cross facing him i think that was the only thing i missed noticeably well, uh, one or uh, one or two of them missed one or two of them the reason why it may have been because the other two were live rounds out of but it didn't look <laughs> smooth i don't know um but he needs a little work on that but then he rear naked choked the guy and he fucking tapped out it was great and you know i remember god it was a couple of months ago we were talking about you can't see and I'm not saying this was a, the greatest debut in the history of pro wrestling, or it was like, you know, Ronda Rousey at WrestleMania, which obviously had more high priced talent involved and a lot more, you know, uh, uh, rehearsal, if you will. But I said on a show a few months ago, you never get to see anybody anymore that when you first see them, they're, like, oh, shit, wow, ho. Oh like you used to before everything was recorded and put on the worldwide internet. You could always find somebody that would surprise you that would, you know, but in this case they managed to do it because if anything, from the way that he's just been hanging around and a couple of times he got physical several months ago and threw some kicks that didn't do him any favors. You kind of had, it was that old mad TV skit, lowered expectations. And all of a sudden he's far exceeding them and the people are getting into it. And so it was a combination of, it was a really good debut and he's got a lot of talent and a lot of oomph to him, to his personality. And people were just surprised because it was better than they thought it was going to be and better than it had a right to be probably. So I, I really enjoyed it. I thought it was great. You know, he's been such a fascinating character that the fans really started taking to. Remember, like, there was even, like, a pop when Punk said, send Hook. Yeah. <laughs> because there's been this mystery around him. He has a hairdo, like, it's not Flock of Seagulls. It's kind of like Flock of Seagulls go to Long Island now. <laughs> but it, get shit on by the seagull. Yeah, but, you know, my 12-year-old daughter saw that, and she was intrigued. And he carried himself well. He didn't crack. At no point did you see him smile and think, oh, this guy is playing a character. You said he started playing it up. It was like, remember when Sid came in as a heel in 89, he started doing things. And as soon as he started hearing any reaction from the fans, he would turn yeah. and look to where they were. And then yeah. they would react more. Hook, same thing. He's con- he was controlling them. Yeah. You know, once the once that he saw that it was getting over and he and they were getting into it, then he oh, okay, I got these motherfuckers now. I wouldn't have given Fuego del Sol as much as they did. Yeah. I may have kept it a little shorter. It's not the biggest complaint in the world, but showed a ton of potential and he has a great look. And I will never discount a wrestling promoter's ability to fuck shit up. <laughs> but AEW And we've only seen him once, so let's not go crazy. This isn't Owen Hart, you know, when he debuted and he was the greatest wrestler anyone had ever seen before. We just saw this guy, but AEW has several people that within five years, they're all still going to be in their 20s. Hook, MJF, Dante Martin, Darby, especially Darby Crash, Darby Allen. Darby Crash. He's based on Darby Crash. Apparently he, he's Darby Crash and Gigi Allen, and that's why he's Darby Allen. I did, okay, I didn't know there was a Darby Crash. Oh, yeah, Darby Crash, also known, maybe the funnier name is Bobby Pin. 
But Darby Crash was the lead singer of the Germs, who are a legendary, infamous, influential punk band from L.A. He famously, both him and Gigi Allen both overdosed on heroin. He overdosed on heroin. They think it may have been a suicide, thinking, you know, he wanted to do this. He was having a rough life. And unfortunately, didn't get a lot of coverage because he decided to overdose on the same night that John Lennon was murdered. Go, oh go! So it was other than like Rodney Bingenheimer's show in L.A., it wasn't even like a blip on the radar anywhere because it was John fucking Lennon. See, now that's a cosmic rib. You couldn't have fucking done it two days beforehand or waited a week, huh? But that was Darby Crash. And then Gigi Allen, you're very well aware of Gigi Allen. I know you're a big fan. Hey, well, yeah, I'm very well aware of G hit yeah. songs like suck my ass it smells and bite it you scum <laughs> and get get your fucking car off my fence that was a big <laughs> hit he had on the country chart but my point was sammy Guevara. you could probably put on the list aew has a lot of intriguing and some that have already shown a lot of real talent and some that are sh still in the potential page powerhouse hobbs the gun kid there's a lot of people the young gun there's a lot of people who are young who even if you want to look at AEW three years from now, five years from now, they're still going to be in their 20s. They're developing better than NXT, if things work out, a better crew of stars for the next five years. Because they have all these people and they're not killing them on TV. I mean, if they put Hook in there with Orange Cassidy, it's going to change the way we see things. But, I mean, it's pretty exciting, actually. I'm excited about the future when you see things like this. Well, but also... Will they have enough veteran and or mainstream talent to uh, keep them from learning the bad habits that they will learn from some of the people on the roster that they may be tasked to work with? Therein lies the, the rub. Well, it depends when you're talking about. You're talking about three years from now, five years from now. Who will be going to AEW? Will Seth Rollins be finally ready to accept his fate by then, or will he still be worshiping Vince McMahon? We don't know, but it's intriguing. Well, and, and, and look, they have – the other thing is – I said that my daughter watched. AEW's younger guys appeal to wrestling fans, but they can appeal to girls. The young bucks don't appeal to girls. Right. Hook, even MJF, because girls like to hate him. I've seen this <laughs> in my house with my kids and sometimes their friends watching if I have it on. Darby, Sammy, like these are people that actually appeal to girls and uh, teenage girls even. So I think... There's something there. There really is. Now, wait a minute. You mean that the teenage girls aren't just all their hearts a, a flitter and a Twitter for Grayson Waller or uh, some of the NXT kids over there? No. You see, Hook, they think they can beat them up. I actually said this the other day to someone in AEW. Hook, because I watched my daughter watch the match with me. You know, like the girls now, they used to be this stupid show called Kirby Buckets with this stupid fucking kid. I forget what it was on. It was like Disney or Nickelodeon. Kirby Buckets? Kirby Buckets. The head writer must have been a Minnesota Twins fan. Kirby Puckett, Hall of Fame player. So the kid became Kirby Buckets. He was a little dweeb on the show. I only know this because years later on Cobra Kai, which is a hit show and it's fantastic for anyone my age who grew up with the Karate Kid, this Kirby Buckets putz, he's now got a mohawk and he's hawk. And he's still, he's a putz, he's Kirby Buckets, but the girls now like him because he's got kind of like that hawk edge. That's the kind of shit with Hook. These girls see someone like that with that attitude, they like that. And again, I think there are wrestlers that appeal to women and wrestlers that appeal to girls. Like the Von Erichs appealed to girls. The Young Bucks don't appeal to girls. I hate to go back to them over and over. I'm using them as an example. It's not even to really hit on the Young Bucks being unappealing to women. Oh, what about the Puddin Gang? With old Muffin Top Taylor, I'm sure he's a sex symbol. I don't know. You you have a lot of young guys in their early 20s. There's something that could be done there. As long as none of them are fucking crazy sex pests or something. <laughs> There's something to be done there with marketing them towards girls and women. That's all I'm going to say. Oh, it's as long as none of them are crazy sex pests. You have to say that nowadays with wrestling. You never know. I... You get behind someone, you support them, and then it turns out, oh my God, they've been... You know, sharing fucking photos of women they defecate on with everyone they've ever met. You never know. I think most of the guys in this business these days under the age of 25 would have to go into serious training to become sex pests, to know how. Good. Um, but as, as far as, let it be known that Hook's debut and the young 
movement in AEW had Brian Last pounding on his desk here on this program today. I was doing that for edits. Edit me here. Edit me here. I don't, want, <laughs> don't let anyone hear this. It's too you complimentary. Edit this. <laughs> you were worked up and you're, and you're, you're given the sermon on the mount. There. But, you said, and- but you know what? You said something really important before and I hadn't thought about it in that context, but we've seen it a few times lately where you actually get excited to see someone for the first time. You don't get that. And we've received a lot of emails. I think we may have talked about it on the show, but again, XT, even though you're seeing these people on TV, in a normal world, you'd be excited about seeing these people go up to the main roster and get an opportunity. That would always go away quickly. You'd realize what was going to happen. Hook's a guy we've been seeing for a while. You actually finally get to see it. It wasn't just me. If you saw Twitter, if you saw different places, people went nuts over this yeah. guy. And, and, and that's an yes. excitement you don't see a lot nowadays. Well, and and again, it's it's a comet. It's a perfect storm. We use that analogy after the events of the last week. Um, you got a kid that really is good. He's it, it attracted attention by the bizarre method of not really ever doing anything to the point where he was getting more attention than anybody who did anything because people were joking about him never doing anything. And you have the fact that not a lot of people are impressed with debuts anymore because not a ton of them are impressive. And so they're like, yeah, give us more of this. And that's, and that's a good thing for him. And I hope he rides it to the fucking, to the moon. Uh, That's the other guy. Man, they got to take care of Team Taz. Seriously, powerhouse Hobbs. We've raved about him and everyone sees it. Taz is great on the mic, but he doesn't really do any, like he's not really a manager. He never goes to ringside with any of his people. He didn't go to ringside with his son. (laughs) Ricky Starks. I'm thinking he may be okay. I heard he's working on their YouTube shows and they did something the other day when Punk ran in where you finally got Punk and him. I say finally like anyone else cares, but Punk went through every member of Team Taz other than Ricky Starks. They did this Leo Dante thing, which I'm not going to blame Leo or Dante for the fact that in one week, the guy signed the contract and then turned back babyface for no reason. (laughs) But there's got to be something better to be done with Team Taz. And maybe it's an East Coast thing where I see it a little differently than others, but I think people would really get behind a good stable with these guys being the focus and you add to that at different points. I just wish we could... uh, You can't develop Hobbs if you never see Hobbs. They start these projects where any number of people have potential and, okay, let's get it going, and then they just go away. Whether, you know, Pillman or Hobbs or any of the other people we've talked about. Oh, geez. Yeah, that was good for a couple of weeks. And it, it's, it, you don't just let people drop in every so often if you're trying to get wrestlers over. So, uh, you know, I don't, I don't know. But anyway, it, it's, it's not like that they had time to put a, budding talent like powerhouse Hobbs on this show because the main event in any arena in the world as long as they're not trying to sell tickets adam cole and wheeler utah of the pudding gang that was their tv main event on rampage and we're wondering about the ratings there's no need to do you remember back in 1979, during the height of the disco craze, there was a song called uh, by a, a duo called Bell and James. Living it up, living it up, oh yeah, Friday night, living it up. They need to redo that. The AEW theme for Rampage is now giving it up, giving it up, oh yeah, Friday nights, giving it up, giving it up, we quit. They're not even trying. So this is where they put the main event of Adam Cole and Wheeler, Utah. Like anybody wants to see, I don't know, fucking Frank Sinatra sing a duet with somebody's fucking niece at a fucking singing recital. Uh, And and Hook's debut, which turned out to be good, but I don't know necessarily was a ratings grabber on its own. And this is where they've exiled FTR to die. On Friday nights. So do you think they've just, they've got an hour of national cable television and they've just thrown up their hands and said, fuck it. 
We got a million, more than a million people to watch CM Punk in August. And now we're just going to give them this. And they're getting four or 500,000. Your thoughts. I think uh, they've got a lot of YouTube shows and they're filming stuff constantly. Do something else with this Friday show. Adam Cole, you know what? I didn't really watch this match, so I can't review it. I gave up on the show. But oh, no, I, tur I turned it off. I was insulted. But what I was going to say is, for whatever you want to say about the WWE system, and we didn't get to see him with a haircut on the main roster as a manager, but they did Adam Cole a lot better. This has been terrible. Yes. I don't want to see the guy. I don't want to see the guy. At this point, he is all entrance and hair. That's it. And I don't want to see it. And Wheeler Yuta's talented. We saw him in the Ring of Honor tournament last year, but he's with the fucking jerk-off gang. I'm an adult. That's it. That's the, uh, that's the impasse. They're the jerk-off gang, and I'm an adult. <sighs> but let's uh, talk for a second about, is there anybody now that, that they've demonstrated it on national television that cannot see what I'm talking about with the Lucha Brothers and why they're the last team that needs to be in the ring with FTR? Did this tell everybody, or are they still not trying to see it because Felix does a triple fucking gainer and a double Lindy off the fucking turnbuckle once in a while. I'll say that I saw it more here than any other time previously. And I've always cut them a little more slack than you, obviously, but they're going to do their shit and they're going to have their match no matter what. And FTR probably handled it as well as a serious wrestling tag team. that doesn't specialize in gymnastics can, but I'm ready for FTR to move on to something else. Well, it, it, of all the of all the feuds that do lots of rematches for this, may have yes, not been the one. The the one they never do rematches except this. They're going to give it to us until FTR is dead and buried. That's probably why we're getting it. It is. It's a hit. Uh, but I will enumerate some of the things for those because I've heard people who say, "Hey, we like to wait." to watch the show until we can put your review over the show since the announcing is sometimes haphazard. We don't listen to it anyway. And that way we can see, and it's a learning type of experience for fans and wrestlers alike. Um, I knew it was a bad sign when the corpse referee was in charge to begin with, because that's, that just means that there's going to be chaos abundant. Uh, but within the first minute of this match, FTR was having to stand there, wave their arms in a stationary position. Once in a while, they turn a circle, wait on the guys to do their tumbling and their intricate little gymnastics routine, sometimes using FTR as vaulting blocks to jump off of, to do offensive things to the other guy. Then... And Penthouse stopped everything in the match to do the goofy glove bit that he does in every single match, but this time there was a wrinkle. Instead of just making the opponent, the heel, look like an idiot, but stop, the old put the hand up, like the old midget spot, Cowboy Lang in Little Tokyo, he goes to take the glove off and Cash Wheeler stops him and does something, so he comes out of it and t tosses the glove to Cash who catches it and stands there to get super kicked. So now they're doing seventies midget spots. Then after they do, they go into a tag team spot where both teams are going to do a blind tag. FTR does a perfect legal blind tag. The Lucha brothers do a sloppy illegal backslap blind tag. And then the Lucha brothers fucked up their own spot. And couldn't get in the right fucking place. Then they started getting some heat on Felix. And Tully even interfered. Imagine that. So we, they, there's a heel manager actually doing heel things. That was lovely. But then before the break, before the first break in the match, they've gotten, gotten a little brief steam on Felix and he makes his own comeback and beats up both guys. And they go to the break with both heels down and the baby face in, in seeming in control, even though he was selling too, but he's got it well in hand. That's the exact opposite of the spot you go to the break on. 
they come back from the break and they're getting heat on Felix again. I guess we missed all their heat in the break. But suddenly he makes his own comeback against both guys again. Then botches the spot to drop behind him and set up the hot tag. Then hits a lackluster hot tag because he'd already made his own comeback to begin with. Which is an old trick of Jerry Lawler's in Memphis. When you got the heat on Lawler in a tag match, he would start his own comeback and then he would tag his baby face partner in to continue the comeback. That's the way he'd say it. He'd say, I'll start to come back a little bit. I'll tag you in and you continue it. Once you've started your own comeback, you've made your fucking comeback. <laughs> exactly. Then Penthouse made a comeback and beat up both guys too. Then the Lucha Brothers went for their finish, the package pile driver double foot stomp to the ass off the top rope, and Tully comes up on the apron and distracts Felix, and Felix is face to face with him, and Tully goes to swing a punch, and Felix blocked it, and Felix is supposed to nail Tully, right? Well, he blocks the punch, and he snatches Tully and then he turns around to start milking the people at his fist up. Should I, should I, should I? Well, there's certain spots where that is entirely apropos, especially if you're in the middle of the ring and all the attention is on you. But since this was this, everybody else was still in motion or needed to be because they were setting up the next deal and Felix was involved in the next spot. So everybody had to be motionless waiting for Felix and you can see Tully like three times say swing it swing it or whatever he said hit me hit me and finally hits him and it's a big pop but the timing there because they don't teach timing in the lucha territories the timing there block it bam swing nail get the big pop look at the people and fucking glorify yourself for a second and then go into your next fucking position because the other guys are waiting on you because they've got more gymnastics yet to do. So there's Tully going to hit me, hit me, hit me. Boom, he hit him. Got a big pop. They did some more gymnastics. Dax hit a nice slingshot power bomb and only got a two count. Then Cash goes to get the tag team title belt and he and Felix have a tug of war with the belt. And Felix jerks it backwards and hits fucking Dax and knocks him goofy with the belt. And then they did some more shit. And then somehow somebody had shoveled or the belt had been dropped. And Felix goes up to the top and splashes Dax, but Dax holds the belt up. And Felix gets hit in the face with the belt cover. Two count. God damn it. And then FTR hits their finish, not well, I don't know if he's in the right place, whatever, but on Felix, and Penthouse does a dive off the top and knocks one of FTR into the cover and breaks that up, so that's a two count. Then, everything came to a fucking halt, and all four guys staggered up, and they were fighting like they were fatigued and they had a four-way one-two spot. Boom, 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 boom. And then they did more big moves. I'm wearing out here. I'm blowed up talking. And then Cash and Penthouse got lost for a minute because Penthouse couldn't just swing so he could duck or whatever. But then they got it back and they rolled up. Cash and Penthouse were rolling each other up until... Penthouse rolled him up into the spike pile driver double stomp, which they did. And then Felix, as he does in every other match that they ever have since the dawn of time, hits the move and then distracts from the one, two, three by doing a dive out of the ring onto the other heel that's always somehow in the right place. They did that in MLW one time, and the, the camera, the director completely missed the one, two, three because. He was watching the guy dive out of the ring. Anyway, so FTR goes down to defeat again. And to make it worse, again, they had the perfect finish to beat FTR and give him a bitch. And they made that a false finish. 
went another three or four minutes, did a bunch more shit that didn't make sense, and then beat him flat. Why couldn't that have been the finish? When fucking <laughs> Felix jerks the belt away from Cash and hits Dax, and the referee was distracted and didn't see it. Cover! One, two, three! They foiled the heels. They outsmarted them. They didn't just beat them like fucking powder. And they roll out of the ring and leave the ring and the, the heels to the ring to bitch. But they can't ever leave well enough alone or give FTR the merest of a, the most microscopic out for just getting beat over and over. Your thoughts. I was surprised they had another rematch where once again FTR lost. I'm sick of seeing these two teams wrestle. Even the matches I really like with FTR and AEW, the finishes always seem to be screwy. Unnecessarily screwy. I am ready for FTR to do something else. And uh, I also think they have to establish themselves as badasses. You know, like they'll do something where they attack someone and then they are shown to look like jokes for weeks. Like, seriously, get rid of Tully. Either get them with a manager or put them with another wrestler or have someone else and make them badasses and have them win matches. But otherwise, I don't know what they're doing. They're treading water. Since they've been there, badasses, they ne they get hurt. Cash got hurt for real. Uh, but they, anything they do to anybody, they never show the effects past limping out of the ring when the match is over with and then everybody's fine. And I assume they're going to do something else. Uh, they're going to put somebody else over again. Uh, because... After this match, then the girls had a tag team match. Less said, the better. And then Tony Schiavone's in the back with Sting and Darby Allen. And he asked them a question. And before either babyface has a single solitary syllable, FTR and Tully come in from behind and kick the shit out of them. And, the, and actually, they fought back, and then they got got him down again and, and they grabbed Sting and held him until he kicked Sting in the balls. So, this, again, standing alone, this might have been fine, but since it happens two to five times on every AEW television program, guy in the back being interviewed by Shivani, Shivani asks a question, guy doesn't speak, his opponent comes in from mere feet away, off camera, Kicks the shit out of him. It has no impact there. Tully is the one who gets the heat by kicking Sting in the balls. Are that does that mean that unfortunately now Tully at 70 is going to wrestle Sting at 62? If it means we don't get Tully versus Arn, I'll take it. I did uh, yeah. Ah. But again, there's no impact to doing this because they do it all the time. This was more well done than most of them. But uh, what the fuck? It's just, it's like an attention deficit disorder booking by fantasy fans on the internet. This is a thing they do in wrestling. So we must do this. So now FTR can get beat by a 150-pound man and his 62-year-old mentor. Ha, it's your show! Well, that was AEW Rampage, another wonderful Friday night. And of course, when it comes to going on a rampage, some of you may want to go on a rampage with your phone and just take picture after picture of your family, your friends, your dog, your property, maybe candid photography and of course if you are on a rampage of photography terror you need a place to send these photos the best place for anyone to send their photos is skylight frames you remember when you used to have to develop these things when you'd take pictures at christmas time and you wouldn't see them until spring and the and the the, the dogwoods were in bloom because you wouldn't remember to take the film in to get developed and then you wouldn't remember to go pick it up, and it used to take 
sometimes a week anyway, and then it got they got it down to 24-hour photo developing. And now, wow, that was just the greatest thing since sliced sourdough bread. But anyway, folks, now it's instantaneous, instant gratification. And not only can you take a picture anywhere of anything and anybody and see it at any time instantly, but now you can send them to people and let those people see them too. Thanks to our friends at Skylight Frames. As Brian had meandered around and and uh, had small strokes in the transition there and tried to tell you, if you get a Skylight Frame for anyone in your life, your even non-tech-savvy people like mom and dad, grandma and grandpa, or your cousins, nephews, aunts and uncles, whatever the case may be, you get this Skylight Frame and everybody in the family can get the personal Skylight email address to this frame and send the recipient photos, photos to make them smile, photos to make them laugh, photos of the tree that they used to have in their last resting place. And it pops right up on the Skylight frame. It's a great gift for anybody at the holiday time. And if they ain't uh, in the immediate vicinity of the family, if they ain't, my grammar is horrible today. If they're not, in the immediate vicinity of the family, they feel like they're there because they're seeing everybody waving at them on their skylight frame. They can swipe through the pictures with their finger. They can even give a finger to the person who sent the photo or tap, use your finger to tap the thing and thank the person, giving them the finger. Folks, if you don't love the skylight frame, they give you a full refund. And I, I understand from Brian Last, they will actually not hold your pictures hostage and no. or use them as blackmail to get you to rethink your refund request. Not only will they not do that, it's completely unreasonable and unexpected why anyone would even bring that into the conversation. That is not a possibility. It's not an option. It won't be happening. You and your photos are safe. What's well, it's the first thing, first thing I thought of, but you, you shot that down. But folks, I understand that when you give your, like, for example, your mother, one of these for Christmas or their or their birthday, they will cry tears of joy. So if you'd like to make everybody in your family cry for Christmas this year, folks, go to skylightframe.com. That's S-K-Y-L-I-G-H-T-F-R-A-M-E.com. Promo code DRIVE, and you're going to get $10 off your Skylight Frame. Skylightframe.com. Enter the code DRIVE. $10 off one of these state-of-the-art, gorgeous-looking black frames with a white mat with the screen that projects a slideshow of your life. What could be more fitting for the holiday season than to bring all your family members around and if you don't want to tell them to kiss your ass, get them a skylight frame. That's right. I won't even talk about what photos you could send of your desires on the sky you know you're using my material i am i am and i was trying to stay away from that because it's a holiday well season. sometimes the transition out of the segment is as difficult as the transition into the segment well only for you jim we have breaking news this is now coming in just being reported sean ross sap of fightful.com has reported on twitter that fightful select has learned kevin owens has re-signed with wwe Boom! What are your thoughts on that? My thoughts are that apparently uh, his old friends were not as persuasive as the uh, large amount of money that uh, Uncle Vince has decided to kick in his direction. And and for once, I believe he may have made a good decision. Because Owens or Vince? Well, either one. Owens especially. Because... Now it's starting to get ridiculous and they're losing a bunch of guys, a bunch of talent to AEW. And so I bet you that because it's not like Kevin Steen to not want to be a pain in the ass about a negotiation over anything, a parking spot, what to eat for lunch. So I bet you he jacked the WWE out of considerable cash to not go over there and play with all the rest of his friends. As he should have. As he should have. But see, now now I don't know. You know, all the things they've been having him do lately, and he seemed real thrilled with them all. 
Remember, we even said one time, he just kind of rolled out of the ring like, thank God this is over. There's a look on his face, something he did not long ago. Uh, let's see if his creative... It's a great negotiating gets, tactic. Well, let, let's see if his creative gets any better after this, or if he's going to be miserable but highly paid for the next however many years. You know, every few years, Howard Stern would announce that he was going to retire from radio, that he's had enough, that he doesn't think that the bosses are paying him enough every time his contract came up. And then they gave him the moon and he re-signed that he shut up for a few years and then it repeated <laughs> itself over and over again. I think Kevin Owens was in a fantastic position. If he wasn't dead set on AEW, he was in a great position to negotiate a good deal for himself and his family. Yeah, and, and somebody reported, and I don't want to mention any names because I don't remember who it was, but that some people in NXT are still not considering that O'Reilly or Gargano, either one, are gone. They may be, uh, their contracts may have expired, but they haven't actually showed up on the neighbor's doorstep yet. So, I'd, 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 obviously, I'd love to see O'Reilly uh, get a chance to be featured on a better program than NXT and and get back together with the group that he was best used in. Same face, I could give a shit whether he goes one place, goes the other place, or opens up a fucking fruit stand. Um, but it'll be interesting to see now if they just break the bank to get these guys to stay just simply because of the perception that they're losing so many guys to AEW. Well, the difference is he's a main roster guy, Kevin Steen, Kevin Owens. Um, the other guys are, I mean, I don't envision Johnny Gargano surviving on the main roster the way things currently are set. No. And Kyle O'Reilly, too, even though I think Kyle O'Reilly is an amazing talent. Well, and, and, and I don't see that, uh, that they would give him the opportunity, but at the same time, I think they'd probably want to keep him for NXT, and who knows how much money they're willing to spend to do that. So we shall, we shall see, but at least, at least Steen fucking bent him over. So that's, uh, that's, one, that's one in his win column. Because you know, I mean, from working, unless he's changed a lot in the last 10 years and maybe has figured out, oh, golly, I probably shouldn't just, I don't know, jump off the balcony in fucking Milwaukee in front of 400 people. Now that he's older and he's had more injuries and he feels, and he's had a chance to make some money and he wants to continue making it, he may not be all about, oh, I want to go over here and have creative freedom and religious fulfillment. He may just be saying, hey, I might ought to stick with the company that they may be assholes but they're stable and they'll pay me a fucking fortune not to go who do you think would be the better fit on the AEW roster now that we know he's not going it's easy to say not him but who do you think would fit better kevin owens or Sami Zayn? oh god zane um because they would all love to have the matches steen can work and he and he, he wanted to do all that shit years ago i haven't paid attention a lot lately he's probably toned it down some but to me zane would be uh right up their alley for all the guys that want to have all the fucking pwg style matches like that was ever a thing to aspire to um so he probably would fit in better with more of the guys on the roster with having those type of matches but you know, who would draw more money? Probably Steen, because even though we found out Sammy can talk, Steen's still better at that. Well, Jim, speaking of Canadians and wrestling, of course, Kevin Owens has had a very successful career and got to assume he's now making more money than he ever dreamed of in WWE. But there's another side to Canadian wrestlers, and there's one that's been in the news this past week. And this is one of those ones where I feel like we could both stand up and say, I told you so to a whole bunch of people. Oh. But what do you think about uh, the latest story involving Slow Devon? Well, and I've, it, we have joked about this guy because it's low-hanging fruit, uh, and it was funny, but apparently the, the, the wrestler, you, you people out there in internet land may, may have heard of the wrestler, I use those, that term in quotation marks, named Hannibal, that... He made big news this past weekend, apparently went off his fucking rocker and stabbed some 
poor local referee in the head with a spike about I don't know how many times and tore his artery and the guy had to have surgery where he they said this guy lost a liter and a half of blood or more than that that doesn't sound too fucking appetizing to me but I I already saw somebody on Twitter because people have been asking, well, what do you think about this? What do you have to say about it? And some people were asking, well, it may be a work. Comments were on the internet. Well, they're working. And, and what did we think about it? And you're right in that we have been on the forefront of mentioning that this guy's a goof. But somebody on Twitter said, well, Cornette and Last, they hate Hannibal, so they're not going to be. I got news. I don't hate this guy. I've never met this guy. I've never talked to this guy. I don't intend to change those policies. Uh, but I don't hate him. In the past, we have amused ourselves at his expense because, as I mentioned, he's a goof. And he's it's funny to make fun of him, especially because anytime you say anything at all about the guy, he loses his fucking mind. And starts putting up response videos or fucking his side of the story or blah, 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 or whatever the fuck, because he's apparently a mental case. But we don't hate him and uh, haven't been searching for a reason to knock him, but he is, since he has delivered one to us, this fucking guy is a glaring example of another reason why the business was better when it was controlled and only professionals could be involved. Because since it got deregulated and or anybody can become a promoter and anybody can become a wrestler, most of the time it's just people playing on a local level and it doesn't hurt anything except the people's feelings that have to watch the stuff. But in th this is the classic example of how Anybody can get into wrestling. Anybody can be a wrestler. Anybody can get booked. Anybody can work on a show anywhere. This is what creates a Frankenstein monster. Because you get a guy like this that is not in any way smart to the wrestling business. You can tell that from the interviews he does. That he pays legends and or people in the wrestling business to talk to him on Skype so that he can put it up on his YouTube channel. He doesn't know anything about the people he's talking to. That's one of the things that we've made fun of. And he doesn't really have any knowledge of wrestling history, and he's never actually wrestled anyway. He was in the developmental program for about, what, 15 minutes, the 10 or 15 years ago. Because of his size, they offered him a chance to train. But when, he, when they found out the edit, he had Hep C, which he claims he got from Abdullah the Butcher, they reneged on that agreement, and then he sued Abby and won the lawsuit, and Abby never paid him. Uh, real quick, can I jump in here? Go ahead. Because I've had more back and forth with this idiot than even you have. I didn't know you'd spoken to him. I've never spoken to him, but the first time we ever made fun of him on 605, in a benign way, look, he's an idiot. He's an idiot. How do you decide you want to interview wrestlers, and then you know nothing? That's embarrassing. Well, also, let's face it, it. He's got the television personality of a fucking cadaver. Uh, if you propped up Weekend at Bernie after Bernie expired, if you propped him up, gave him a Canadian accent, and told him to do a spooky voice, th that's the personality you'd get for this guy on camera. So it, it's easy to make fun. If you asked me to point to someone who clearly ate paint chips as a child, I would point to him. <laughs> I would point to him and I would question the toxicity of Canadian paint chips compared to what we have over here. But this guy does all these interviews and he sucks. But the beginning of the story, it all starts with everyone giving him sympathy. He was doing garbage matches, booking his own shows. Apparently part of the reason is because people don't want to use him. Yeah. So then the scam became, I'm going to come to your show and I'll pay to be there and I'll bring my own people. <laughs> and I just want to film it in front of fans. So this guy, the story is Abdullah came and Abdullah cut him without him knowing it and he got hepatitis C. Let me just say, Abdullah cutting people without them knowing it absolutely happened all the fucking time. 
Did Abdullah the Butcher give him Hep C? We don't know for sure. And I only say that because I know enough people that know people involved in this that have always questioned that part of it. So we don't know for sure. But what I do know for sure, part of the story is that cost him everything. That cost him the WWE. He would have gone there and look at his size. He would have been a big star. He wouldn't have lasted five minutes in that fucking locker room. No. And you know it. And everyone out there in the business fucking knows it. You think Randy Orton was going to put up with this fucking clown? You think anyone in that locker room was going to put up with this guy? And his Dino, creepy Dino behavior. Dino Douche didn't make it through their developmental. And he's not nearly as big of an idiot as this guy. He wouldn't have lasted he, five he, minutes. It, they would have. It, they would have put a revolving door in there just because of, as we mentioned, the guy is a, a complete. Mark can be a derogatory term, or Mark can be a term of endearment. I'm a Mark for so and so, or I'm a Mark for such and such. But this guy is a Mark, as you've mentioned, and we're going to talk about what he did here in a second. But as you mentioned, the deal that he's been doing is that he pays for himself to, he transes himself, as they say, to some wrestling event in Texas. Usually there's been a couple places in Texas. First one won't use him anymore. Now the second one's banned him. He transes himself in. He says, you don't have to pay me. Let me work my gimmick, Blood Hunter. <sighs> <It's> <laughs> I need content and I need blood. I'm the content hunter and the blood hunter. And uh, the the uh, irony has not been lost on anybody that the guy who supposedly lost his big major career he was going to have because he had a bloodborne illness, his gimmick is the blood hunter and he makes people bleed. He brings himself in. He, you don't have to pay him. He's going to wrestle. He also brings in his opponents and or contributes to their fee. He also brings in his own manager Poor Selena De Laurenta at the last yeah. Texas thing he got kicked out of. She put up with it for a while. And finally, <clears throat> and we talked, Selena De Laurenta is obviously a 125 pound female. And she was managing him because he was paying her and he was paying himself and he was paying the guy, just let me tape it and put it on my YouTube channel. So if people think that I'm a, actually a wrestler, right? And I've got this gimmick. The One of the finishes he came up with was to power bomb Selena De Laurenta off the ring onto his opponent who was laying on a table to, in order to beat his opponent. He was going to sacrifice his manager. And in the process of all this, something else that she didn't know was going to happen, either him, his opponent, or both got blood all over her fucking designer dress that cost about three times more than she was going to make to be there that was not cleared with her ahead of time. She didn't know it was coming. And she's like, and she doesn't go out in a potato sack like Marjorie Maine and Ma and Pa Kettle on the farm because she's <laughs> Selena De La Renta. So she's like, who's going to pay for my fucking dress? What the fuck's going on here? You know, as the kids say, peace out, motherfucker. She bailed on that deal. So anyway, now... As we said, apparently this guy, he works under a mask and his gimmick is Blood Hunter, and he finds uh, another... Uh. You know, that would have been a great gimmick if, like, Keith Richards needed a guy in, like, 75, if he was, like, a heel manager, because he was always getting those blood transfusions and, like, yeah. Alps, the Blood Hunter. Where's my Blood Hunter? Uh, blah. Peter Cushing. Wikipedia. Uh. All right, cowboy. But anyway, idiot. so this fucking what an idiot, idiot. What an idiot. This fucking idiot goes down to Texas to work on this little independent show. And we've seen the video. This thing can't be on television. I don't know anything about this promotion, but it's obviously shot for YouTube or whatever. And there's, I don't know if there was a couple hundred people there. Maybe, maybe not. And they've tried to light the thing and whatever. And it's a local promotion. I'm not blasting people doing local wrestling promotions. But, and it's also hard when you're a promoter. It's hard to argue with a guy. Well, I'll pay. You don't have to pay me and I'll get there for free. And I'll bring a manager and I'll chip in on my opponent. And I'll do all this and that and the other thing. You supply the blood. Yeah. But so he goes down there and he wants to to get his gimmick over in this little local promotion that's not even on television. And there's no 
if anybody is under the delusion that this is going to go anywhere as far as drawing thousands of people or getting on real television with the talent involved here, um, he was wrestling Carlito. And Carlito was not going to fucking go for any of this fucking bullshit, right? So, apparently he has to make somebody bleed, and Carlito ain't going to go for it, so he wants to make the referee bleed after he does a job. Because Carlito also wasn't going to put this fucking clown over. So, they don't, none of the referees are like, no, we're not, we don't get juice. So they find a referee that they've used before that apparently has gotten color before, and he agrees to come in and do it. And this guy's story, apparently his wife died earlier this year. He's been depressed. He's been away from wrestling, but he wanted something to do. You know, and and, and obviously this guy, and this fucking piece of shit, now that I'm thinking about it, fucking piece of shit, Hannibal, he tried to put an explanation video up and say, oh, I was wearing a mask and it's hard to see through. And this, this guy, he's a bleeder. The only reason he's there is because he's a bleeder. He was supposed to be a bleeder. This Mark uses terms like that because he doesn't even know the anything about the fucking business he's supposedly in. He's a fucking Mark from the very word go with the definition of the word. This guy wasn't a fucking bleeder. This is a poor local independent referee that does this every once in a while for the love of the game, probably. And was doing something to get out of the house, and he's probably done it a time or two before with who knows what kind of results, and he said he'd do it. For whatever, and and you can blame him or not all you want to for being, I, it, I know these kind of guys, they want to be involved in the show, and they know they're not going to go to work for the WWE or be on national television, but they can get a picture. Hey, remember when this guy busted me open and look, I'm bleeding. And it's a fucking thing, right? It's like the equivalent of the fans at the ring of honor shows in the old days, liking it when they got kicked in the face by a dive, you can question the fucking judgment, but this is the guy was harmless. The referee. So I couldn't see through the mask. What yeah. was I supposed to do? He couldn't see. Through so the I mask stabbed. That he, that he wears stabbed to more. wrestle in that he wears to wrestle in. <laughs> he couldn't see through it. Oh, and also he blamed other people. They just gave me the gimmick. It was a spike. They just gave it to me before I went out there. Well, motherfucker, if you're a fucking supposed professional wrestler, if you don't know how to work with something, why are you trying with this level of success? So what he does is, and the vi the crummy looking video is out there. Part You can't tell a lot, but... I can tell enough. I've seen the pictures of the guy's head. And and whether anybody wants to believe me or not, I've seen a lot of blade jobs and I've done a few. Probably more of each than many of the current professional wrestlers that are listening to me right now. So you can either consider that I know what I'm talking about or you can just continue to say, oh, it was a work or they're trying to fool somebody or the guy did it himself or whatever the fuck. Apparently, old Blood Hunter goes down and he gets the spike and he's getting it to the referee's head. And you see this guy go down with a blade and try to get some juice. And the backstory has come out from another referee that was on the scene, from this referee, from various people that corroborates what I'm about to say, from everybody except Hannibal's viewpoint. Well, I see the guy's head in the pictures and I see that. And they, it was said that he made the blade himself. Well, you don't do the majority of what was done to this guy's head with a blade, especially one you made yourself. It would almost be impossible. You could try real hard, but with a wrestling blade, no, <clears throat> you do see scratches and the guy went down and he tried to get juice and he did it like an amateur and maybe nobody told him or maybe he just kind of he was he was a little bashful with it and you can see two long scratches where he went from one side of his forehead to the other and probably didn't bleed at all but it scratched and that's when somebody's hesitant not exactly ready to go to the bone for the business and they're trying to make up for it by going long instead of deep and all that does is 
piss you off. If you're going to do it, you've made your blade yourself, you've got it the right way, you've marked your cutting edge so you're not going backwards and ribbing yourself, and, you, and you're following all the protocols, you have to commit. Stick it in, pull it about a half an inch or an inch, and that'll get the job done. My uh, episode with Paul Lee on TBS all those years ago when he hit me with the phone, I've mentioned this. I was not fully experienced enough then to realize that when you're cold and when it's cold in your environment, it takes a minute to come, which is why that I stuck it in and committed the first time and saw nothing. And then I stuck it in and committed two or three more times before everything came all at the same time. And then it was like, ah, oh, shit. But nevertheless, he didn't do that, the referee. So he didn't get any juice. And this is the testimony of everybody was involved except old Hannibal. Old Hannibal got upset because his, his angle was being ruined because the, the juice production, the blood was not to amount, was not to his liking. So he decides to get on top of this fucking middle-aged referee, little milksop looking guy, and hold him down and fucking stab him in the head with this spike that he's supposed to be using as a gimmick. Now, obviously, if it was even introduced into the realm of possibility to use this spike as a gimmick, the spike is not razor sharp. The spike is not meant to cut people. So he's he's stabbing the guy in the head in the head with a, the a fairly blunt spike which is causing puncture wounds in this fucking guy's head and you see not only had to have staples in various places in his head but they had to um do surgery to close up an artery that got punctured because nobody gets juice on the top of their and sides of their head they had to shave this guy's head when they sewed him up, stapled him up, because he had hair. Nobody does that, because besides the fact that you can't fucking tell what you're doing, it, it there's arteries in between the skull bone and your top of your fucking skin, which old Hannibal found one. And apparently when the guy was trying to squirm out from under him to make sure he didn't go anywhere, old Hannibal put a rear naked choke on him, choked him out. So, but and nobody, the other referees are scared to get in the ring with this fucking idiot because he is large, 300 pounds or whatever. And supposedly the promoter didn't even know what the fuck was going on or supposed to go on. Old Hannibal, now he's got a free manager, his girlfriend. He brings his girlfriend to manage him now. She rolls in and tries to pull him off because they're screaming, leave the guy alone. And they pull this guy out of the ring and he's fucking bleeding puddles on the ground. What the fuck? Not only this, but apparently old Hannibal drives himself down. Maybe there's an issue with him crossing the Canadian border to do these under the, the radar, non-sanctioned, don't have paperwork for this to do this in the United States wrestling matches. Because he drove down in an RV where apparently, according to the... And this t this story was on, by the way, the Wrestling Observer site. It's been on all the mainstream sites, been picked up. The referees and other people that were there put it on Facebook and out on the internet. They've set up a GoFundMe for the guy's medical bills. They said that old Hannibal spent most of the day in his RV, and when he came out, he was smelling of alcohol. And the first referee that actually refereed the match told Carlito, get this over with quick, because the description was he was lurching about and something seemed off. So let's just take this whole thing into consideration. This fucking guy who clearly has mental problems, who fancies himself and has for some time a world-renowned pro wrestler when in actuality he pays and this is documented this is not me i can we can produce all kinds of statements to this he pays for himself to be on shows 
and pays for people to manage him and pays for sometimes people to wrestle against him and does all this simply so that he has video of him as a wrestler to put on his own YouTube channel. He's a mental kid. When you, when you even make fun of his goofy voice or his lack of knowledge, he loses his mind and goes on tirades. His whole gimmick is that he's a guy who was denied the opportunity to be this big major wrestling superstar because of a blood illness. So now he's taken that and made it his gimmick and is going out and making everybody else bleed, whether they want to or not, in little tiny fucking buildings in front of nobody for no reason, possibly under the influence. And he's picking on fucking local guys who aren't even in the business anyway, except just as a lark and mutilating them because they don't bleed to his mark specifications. And while we're on a subject, I have often used blood in wrestling and said that it should be used by professionals when there is a goal and the thought of drawing money and selling tickets and it's being done in a legitimate promotion. We didn't go all fucking hardcore garbage deathmatch crazy in Smoky Mountain Wrestling, but people did bleed on TV or in matches when we were building and promoting things that were going to draw literally thousands of people or be seen by literally tens of thousands of people on television in our area. We didn't even have the capability then to go around the world. In Ring of Honor, we didn't use a lot of blood, but we still used it when there was a goal in mind, when there was an internet pay-per-view coming up or a big match or something that was going to draw thousands of people to view it in some fashion or in excess of five figures and, and a couple of those New York shows and pay-per-views, six figures in income. We very seldom had blood in OVW at all because of the Kentucky Commission requirements, but we certainly would have only used it to promote the Gardens events or big events that were going to draw thousands of people. This is a fucking mark going down to some local promotion that, let's face it, is going to be in the state that it's in, no matter who's involved, this time next year and a year after that and a year after that. And because he is such a mark for himself and has such a delusional opinion that he's some famous, talented professional, that because a fucking part-time referee doesn't bleed to his specification in this fucking incident it's gonna fucking damage his career somehow it's gonna put a black mark or a blemish on his reputation he has to take matters in his own hands and say here i'll make you bleed motherfucker you may have a family to go home to in your real life but i'll just stab you in the head 10 times because i can't look bad in front of these 150 people in Corn Row, Texas. What the fuck? What is the matter with this guy? And and I would say what's the matter with the people that employ him? They've banned him. He'll never be back there, but I don't know, other than the He's lure. He's had a of, lot of enablers, though. He's had a well, lot of Well, that's enablers. what I'm saying. Uh, except under the lure of free talent, why would anybody be associating with this fucking guy when you can tell that not only is he a goof, but he's obviously also mentally fucking unstable? money i mean it's really all there is he could offer someone money i mean that's the saddest thing about wrestling that's one of the reasons why i rant about some of the things i do on 605 no matter how much you want wrestling to be upscale in terms of just the way people think of it or the way people look at it or the way it treats itself there's always a scum element that will offer money to people to do whatever with them and there's always people even people with the best intentions like a bruno san martino who will take that money and do it and this clown has been desperate for content. He's got a lot of subscribers, but his actual videos don't do that great. Desperate for content, and it's been a lot of people enabling him. I, I think one of the reasons my heat 
or my back and forth with him started was because I called out CAC. They were letting this guy come and film all of their stuff and put on his channel. Meanwhile, CAC's begging people for money. CAC's yelling at people to go in there and raise money with a raffle. And they're giving away content on YouTube. And he flipped that and it turned out Brian Blair was protecting him because the board of directors had members who wanted to not let him do this anymore. And Brian Blair protected him. Brian Blair has been a Hannibal enabler. And I like Kevin Sullivan. I think Kevin has to explain himself here. But I think Kevin has been way too tolerant of this clown, and it's beneath him. And I think Kevin needs to choose his friends better. And uh, I say that as someone who likes Kevin a whole lot. But there's been a lot of people that, you know, at the end of the day, if you're going to take someone's money, you got to just decide, am I okay being in business with this fucking guy? Everyone knows who this guy is. He has a horrible reputation with women, with people in Canada. With journalists in Canada, with wrestlers in Canada. Anyone in Canada who touches wrestling, <laughs> who has dealt with this fucking great white idiot, has had a bad experience. This guy's a horrible reputation. Anyone in Canada! The payday isn't that good to justify being in business with this clown. And people just need to fucking... I mean, gee, I just wish there were more reputable ways to make money with wrestling, and I get it that there aren't, and I feel bad about that. But everyone needs to just stop taking money from any fucking jerk off because these are the fucking jerk off. This guy just happens to be a dangerous one because he is big and he is strong and he does have real credentials and he's nuts. Someone just sent me an article. Apparently, he loves to sue people. Remember, he threatened to sue me. He put up a video after I made fun of him. It was him. It was a still, it was the funniest thing. This is why I can never hate the guy. He's a source of amazing comedy. He put up a video in response to me making fun of him and how he was so stupid and how his, he knows nothing about wrestling history and he's doing these awful interviews and he also sounds like shit. Made fun of all that. Well, what was he going to sue you for? Telling the truth? This was after I mentioned that I was told, and I was, that he was not invited to be a part of any further Florida fan fest because he put his hands on a fan. And then I made fun of him and how dumb he is. He put up a video of him shirtless with headgear on hitting a double bicep. <laughs> and it was him just like, uh, you got a problem. I'll meet you in a parking lot or I'll sue you. And I'm like, what? First of all, you <laughs> idiot. It, yeah, make up your fucking mind, you dullard. Are you going to sue me? Now, there's a word that does not get used enough these days. Are you going to sue me or are you going to hide in a parking lot? And quite frankly, I'm afraid of what you'd want to do with me in a parking lot. You're a weird freak. You are a weirdo and everyone fucking knows it. And I know a lot of people have been afraid to call you out. I haven't. I've been doing it for a while. You're an idiot. And you're exactly the kind of person the wrestling business needs to stomp out once and for all. Your fucking lifelong audition for Dark Side of the Ring needs to end now. Go away. Go find another job. Oh, what I was telling you before. This will sum up my fucking thing here. I saw an article that he was sued, I think, the city of Ottawa. I guess it's a city. Sued Ottawa because he lost his job. This was in the midst of all the Hep C stuff. I'm thinking, what is this job that he's suing over? He must have, you know, really done something important. Unless I read the article wrong. It was part-time gym attendant. That's what this fucking guy was suing over. This guy's an idiot. Enough. Get money somewhere else, guys. Stop taking money from these people or just risk being associated with them forever. That's well, all I have to say. And see, what, what, here's the thing, because this got all this publicity, especially in non-wrestling news sites, of course, they didn't know how to cover it. Wrestler goes off script and Butcher's referee was one, but also they were some headlines were calling it a botched wrestling thing, whatever. There was nothing botched about this. The, the guy just grabbed the guy and fucking poked him in the head with a fucking spike a bunch of times. You can't really do that right. Um, but again all those non-wrestling sites for all those non-wrestling people that see that they're just now convinced, well, what kind of subhuman fucking sideshow freaks are these people? The referee was supposed to be a bleeder. 
what what kind of world is this? It just makes everybody look like the fucking geek that bites the head off the live chicken. And nothing about this. This is the l- fringest of fringe, carny, low-class wrestling. Not anything about professional wrestling. It was involved in this. The people weren't prepared. F- the, the, the people on the show weren't prepared for something like this because they're all fucking... Hey kids, let's put on a show pitching in local people too. They've never seen shit like this. This guy's probably told them that he is a star and they might believe him. And he's coming in in a big RV from fucking Canada, going to wrestle former WWE superstar Carlito. These people with these little promotions may not know that this guy is not what he pretends to be. And as you mentioned, he's fucking nuts. But it just gives everybody a horrible, again, example or impression of what pro wrestling is or they think it is and and what they're led to believe it is by shit like this. And it makes everybody in it look like a complete fucking idiot. And there's there's no excuse for even even the even the. They were everybody involved in this show was enabling this fucking guy just by humoring him. Why you want to get juice on a fucking referee? You fucking idiot. Like that suddenly is going to sell us a thousand tickets next week. It's it's a vanity project for some fucking guy with money and time on his hands. Cause apparently he has no real job to fucking act out his delusional fantasies about wanting to be a wrestler. And all of these people on these little local shows are not equipped with the experience to be able to process or handle something like this happening. And anybody there that, that could put a stop to it should have a long time before this happened. Is my, what my opinion is. Good. Lord. I completely agree. I mean, this is, this has been in front of everyone's face and just everyone ignoring. Like I said, that's one of the biggest problems with wrestling from the past that needs to end. Where no matter what anyone does, no matter what scummy thing someone does, no matter if everyone knows someone's a complete piece of shit, and then they're like, well, he offered me 500 bucks. Why wouldn't I talk to him? Because he's a piece of shit, you fucking idiot. It's like you walk up to the prettiest girl on the street. You say, will you fuck me for a million dollars? She's like, sure. Then you say, will you fuck me for $5? No, what do you think I am? We've already established that. Well, we're just haggling over price. <laughs> I guess it's you like know, that. It, <laughs> but that's, that's, you know, and again, a lot of people say, well, this is that carny, old-time wrestling. Said, no, none, shit like this, none of shit like this happened in old-time pro wrestling. Yes, you might get the occasional, the, the, the chic or fucking... Who was that that goddamn bladed the guy on a chic show? He bladed Dr. Beach. Jerry Graham, Dr. Jerry. You might get Dr. Jerry Graham's drunk and he's gone out of his mind and he blades fucking somebody. But in in the Kobo Arena in front of 10,000 people, at least, not in a fucking barn in front of 150 in Dallas, and it was at least a blade instead of a spike. Is it, none of this shit is wrestling or old fashioned pro wrestling. It is what people who weren't there or who didn't experience it have read and heard people say and think that pro wrestling used to be like, that's what this kind of thing is. It ain't. Well, Jim, perhaps the people who had the misfortune, including the referee's daughter of being in the building that night to witness this, perhaps the promotion that were there. It's now all of them. I mean, he shifted the blame. Everything that's ever happened to him, it's someone else's fault. It's now their fault. The promoter put out a very. Oh, yeah, oh yes. Yes. We got to mention that before we wrap this up. The gall of this, as Jackie Fargo said one time, the gall of you. They, they basically tell old Hannibal, get the fuck out of here. We don't ever want to see you again. We're not going to use you anymore. You've got to be out of your mind. And this thing hits the news and old Hannibal's excuse video says, I couldn't see because I was wearing this mask and I couldn't see real well. And I thought I was protecting him, but I just got the spike right before we went in the ring. But besides that, they tried to say they fired me and that's not true. I quit. So, so he can't even 
roll over and accept being fired for stabbing a guy in the head with a fucking spike ten times and puncturing his artery. He can't take the L on, well, yeah, they fired me for that. I could take the L on they fired me for that. If I had ever taken a spike and stabbed somebody in the head ten times and punctured their artery and got fired for it, I wouldn't have quibbled. I would have taken that one. But he couldn't because he's a fucking delusional mental idiot. So that's another thing he did. He put out a video blaming the fucking promotion and saying that he quit before they could fire him. What did he have to quit over? What the fuck would you have had to quit over there? He wasn't the one that got spiked in the head. He's the one that did the spiking. So apparently that means the promotion was offended for him to quit to begin with, doesn't it, Brian? Yeah, what was his reasoning for quitting, actually, now that I think about it? Obviously, like you just he said, didn't they, what? He just, they have he just quit caused. before they fired him. <laughs> you, you didn't fire me. I had already quit the night before that you announced that I was fired. I got probably, enough blood. I had hunted enough blood. He probably quit in the RV on the way out of fucking town on the interstate. That's when he quit, after they told him, get the fuck out of here. Well, as I was saying, Jim, you know, the fans... I'm sorry. No, no, no. It ties into it. It ties into it. The fans in the building, as I said, including the referee's young daughter, the promoter, the promotion, the referee himself, maybe even the people who have had the misfortune of seeing any of Hannibal's videos. All of these people need restitution. And you want to talk about videos. I know a man, dare I say, a hero, who has just recently put up a video giving his thoughts on this whole situation, a man who has laid out what the case is, a man who has laid out why certain people shouldn't be allowed back into the United States. People need to remember it's a privilege, not a right. Of course, I think you know who I'm talking about. I certainly do. I cannot add anything to that otherwise than play that funky music, white boy. Stephen P. News. If you need to see an outlaw mud show or two, those are the rest. Yes, folks, if your eyeballs have been assaulted by someone delusionally pretending to be a pro wrestler, and if that same delusional idiot has caused you personal pain and suffering and injury or possibly a ruptured artery, then look no further. The man to call is Stephen P. New at 888-692-8084-NEWLAWOFFICE.COM, who, as you mentioned, Brian, did indeed issue a statement from the legal side of things indicating what could should and potentially will happen to any perpetrators of inner country crime who cross into the the borders of the united states with malicious intent and how that we can stamp this type of problem out but folks he handles all types of problems Big ones, little ones, small ones, tall ones, short ones, fat ones. If you got a problem, Canadian Stephen, ones. Canadian ones. <sighs> Stephen P. New not admitted in Canada. Admitted into the he can be admitted into Canada. I can't, but he he's not admitted into the bar in Canada, but I'm sure he has uh cohorts there that can take care of things. But whatever. If you're being harassed by any type of these people or have any other issues that you need legal rectification over then the law offices of Stephen P. New, as I mentioned, newlawoffice.com, 888-692-8084 can help you right out. And that's another reason why that if a, a certain delusional, weird mental case mm. who's also litigious has any issue with what we're saying that we've just mentioned in this program in the past several minutes, although we do and can produce people to make statements to these effect and everything was all opinion, fact, and reportage of things that have been said elsewhere. Oh, no. We direct you, motherfucker, to Stephen P. New, because he's not any more fond of you than we are.
So try that one on for size, pal. You like apples? How about them apples? All right. We'll tell you a little bit more about Steven at the end of the show, but a great, great man who put out a great, great video. Check it out right now. Where can they check it out? They could check it out on YouTube or I don't have an actual address. Go to Steven's Twitter Steven's page. Steven's Twitter. That's where, that's where yeah. I thought you were going with that. I, I, was, I, was, I lobbed it up for you, but you, you swung and missed. Well, Steven's you're, Twitter you're page. The what is player, Steven's not Twitter me. page? You're the tennis player, not me. You're probably better for the serve. Well, but I'm just saying Steven's Twitter page is. It is. It is. What is know. it? How do I know? God damn it. Well, I thought you'd know. You keep track of all this shit around here. Well, look up Stephen P. New. That's right. He's got his picture on it, doesn't he? I don't know if he has his picture on it. I don't know. It. Well, just look up Stephen It may P. be his New. logo. His logo. He, d- he did a great uh, dissertation on all of the various laws, statutes, rules, and regulations that uh, dipshit broke and, and what should be done about it. I watched that video with... The biggest smile on my face that I just said, that's my lawyer. <laughs> that's my guy. I love him. But Jan, That should have been a 60s sitcom. That's my lawyer. That's my lawyer. Who would have starred in it? Who do you see as being good for that role? Let's see. The role of the law. Well, what are the roles? I mean, obviously there's the lawyer or is it a revolving door of lawyers and the main person is the person who's saying, that's my lawyer. Well, now that's a good idea. I think we should have a main lawyer, but I'd like to see Edgar Buchanan in the show in some fashion. Okay, we'll see what we could uh, do about that in dra- in the drawing form, I guess. Fred McMurray. Fred McMurray might have been good Fred in the role. Fred McMurray could have been the lawyer. And Edgar Buchanan could be Uncle Charlie's cousin. That's right. Well, Jim, let's uh, move on here with some questions and a very popular topic that several people have sent in questions about. Did you see the recent photo posted on The Rock's Instagram page of The (laughs) Rock, Nick Khan, and Nick Khan's sister all having a, um, I don't know, on one side of the table, The Rock has a big smile. Nick Khan looks cold as fuck. (laughs) But did you see this photo that is uh, circulating? It, Nick Khan's sister is, I swear to God, this is, I swear, I swear, Nanachka Khan. And I have Nanachka. seen that name on credits and come to find out that she's a big TV fucking personality. I think she's, I've seen that name on Family Guy, I'm pretty sure. But she's also... The showrunner, as they say, which kind of like the booker in television, from what I can gather, uh, for Young Rock, right? Right, which is one of the worst shows ever. Well, yeah, well, I'm not I'm not saying that she's good or bad, but the point is she's figured in. She's oh, yeah. figured she's, in she's with she's the office, in. as they yeah. say. No, they're all so, figured in. That's what's... They're all figured in. <laughs> Um, and that's, that's, and now everybody's going, what do they mean figured it? That used to be when you were, when you were set, when you were a star, when you had nothing to worry about, when you were figured in all the plans, right? They're figured in. So there's Nick Khan running the WWE and probably going to be the guy after Vince instead of Shane, instead of Triple H, instead of Stephanie, instead of anybody that we ever thought. Here's the rock. Who's the most famous human being on the planet. And in between, here's good old Nanachka Khan. That she's a little, a little, a little dumpy lady. Oh, but come she's on! There's, probably, there's no reason for you to insult Nanachka. Well, no, I'm saying she's a little unassuming, little mousy-looking person that may be the the single most important person in the pro wrestling industry moving forward. And it's this this little dumpy woman who's a showrunner at the network. But she, this, if, if she's the, 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 the glue that binds this thing, that the, the common thing and rock knew them and played with them when they were kids. So I understand when they were kids, they were playing on Waikiki beach. You've been on Waikiki beach, right? I have been there. In fact, that's where King Curtis had his stand surf, surfboard shop where yeah. you can get surfboards or weed. Yeah. If you ever wanted to go to Hawaii. But I understand they were kids and they were running around, you know, Rock's family was there and they had the promotion and the cons were obviously just hanging out with down and out wrestling kids 
because they loved wrestling so much. And well, and also because Andre the Giant and the Iron Sheik were hanging out with him so often. But I understand there was like a, a promise made early on, like on the beach, like as the sun was going down. One day, please come and help me fuck Triple H over. <laughs> and all these years later, it's happened. <laughs> but no, again, there's the rock is probably closer to the fucking guy running the WWE now than he was 25 years ago when it was Vince and he was, a, the rock was their biggest star. And here's the other problem. And I know you like him and I got nothing against him personally. I think his movies suck, but I got nothing against him personally, but people act like because the rock is rich and successful. And again, he makes movies that make a lot of money. They're not yeah. necessarily movies I like, but because he's rich and successful, that somehow he knows what he's talking about and he's really smart. And I'm not saying he's dumb or anything, but that's what you get afraid of, that someone's going to turn to The Rock and go, oh, well, you know everything about wrestling. And I actually don't think The Rock has the best instincts when it comes to what should be done or shouldn't be done in wrestling. Well, I think, I, I think for him, he does. For him, he does. I don't know about And, and it's always about having someone write everything you're going to say. But also, but, but his delivery and, and et cetera. He's got great you delivery. Can't, you can't create, but I thought where you were going was, because some people are going to, we're saying, is The Rock going to buy the W? I'm like, I don't care how rich a movie star he is. He ain't putting five billion all or part of his dollars into a wrestling promotion, any wrestling promotion, I wouldn't think. He's smart enough not to do that. No, he's smart enough to put up money to get like 3% and have some yeah. VC firm put up all the other money and then they make him the boss. That's what he would do. <laughs> That's how smart he is. Yes. The Jeter. Uh, the full Jeter. Johnny Jeter? Derek Jeter. Oh, where, I'm Where is Johnny Jeter? Johnny Jeter, as a matter of fact, just opened a wrestling school in California, and I have been too busy to call him back and get details, but we're going to talk to him or about him on the show here after the holidays when I get time to catch up with him on the phone and... uh and uh, learn more about his training facility that he's opened. But yes, he... Oh, that's cool. I didn't know they, about that. They, they ran him out of the business, the WWE did. They ran him out of the business with a horrible gimmick, so he went back to California. He became a, a trainer and physical therapist, has had a nice, successful career and a normal life, and but he still has the wrestling bug, so he wants to give back a little bit and train guys the right way. And since he spent considerable time at OVW, I have a feeling he'll run a pretty tight ship but but yeah it, so fortunately maybe even though he should have been a big star and they ran him out of the business and destroyed his love for it for quite some time maybe he'll still be able to give back some of his talent by training some future superstars hey let's play with this for a second this idea that well he was running around as a kid with Nick and Nanachka. What a catch. Ooh, Johnny is. Jeter. Oh, you're back to the rock. Back to the rock. That back because of rock. that, that somehow he's definitely going to be tied into WWE. He'll definitely be running it or booking it or involved because his best friend's there. Do you think, because we know the rock grew up seeing some stuff that was good. I mean, Memphis 87 wasn't prime Memphis, but it was still pretty good. All things considered. And he saw good wrestling. He saw a lot of bad wrestling also, but he also came up. And although he was, great at it and he's an all-timer he was maybe the greatest at doing the scripted promos but they were scripted promos he was the best at doing the bad comedy it wasn't as bad when he was doing it because he was so good at it if he was someone in a position of power or control over a wrestling company do you think when i talk about his instincts that's what i'm talking about is this a guy who's going to say get out there and figure out who you are and just do it? Or is he going to say, hey, go sit in the corner and work with this guy on who your character is and come up with something? Uh, well, I think for one thing, he's, he's a student of wrestling and a fan of wrestling. And it's not just that he saw 87 Memphis because he was there. He's watched video. He used to take old classic wrestling tapes on location shoots with him at the in the movies to watch in his trailer. Um, that's where he got the late career appreciation for Austin Idol interviews. But he's seen the good stuff. He knows what the good stuff is. I think he's also smart enough to know that what worked for him because of the unique nature of his personality probably wouldn't work for most anybody else. And he would probably suggest 
to other people in the wrestling business not to do a bunch of the things he did. He'd say, work hard, bust your ass, put in the hours, stay in shape, figure out who you are. I know he, he, I guess he loves that fucking Brian Gerwitz character, the comedy writer. Yeah, he hired him. He works um, for The Rock's company. Yes, yeah, and, and you know, so everybody's got a flaw, so The Rock likes the comedy writer. Um, I still wish I could see video of the fucking screaming fight that Gerwitz and Heyman got into, where everybody was like, please let them fight. Please let them fight. We got to see this. Do you remember what it was over? It was over wrestling, because Gerwitz is a fucking comedy writer, and whether you like him or not, and... Everybody's on different sides of that fence. Heyman's a wrestling guy. So that's, you know, I can see that being enough. Um, and also Gerwitz looks like that pimply faced little 110 pound shit in the corner that you just want to slap down and piss on anyway. So I bet Heyman thought that he might have a chance there. But I, I, I think that Rock is also, he has an appreciation for the classic style of pro wrestling and what pro wrestling was. And I think he would want to treat it something like that. And I think that he would know that for a lot of guys, you know, his path was not going to happen. It was just all the stars lined up and it was the right guy at the right time in the right place. And holy shit. But uh, he still has an appreciation, Rock does, for the actual wrestling business. So I don't, it certainly wouldn't be any worse. Might be a lot better. All right, Jim, well, let's get another question here. This one was sent to cornydrivethrough at gmail.com from Matt in Stony Point, New York. I've noticed over recent years that Hulk Hogan seems to have a number of detractors amongst his wrestling brethren, <laughs> mainly because of his backstage politics. However, I have also noticed that the people who criticize him the most are the people who are constantly criticizing other wrestling figures or also have checkered histories with the business. To name a few of these detractors, Bret Hart, Honky Tonk Man, Matt Osborne, Doink, Scott Steiner, and C... Matt Osborne? When did anybody ever call him Matt Osborne? Except on his birth certificate. Scott Steiner and CM Punk. Hogan seems to have good relations with a lot of other wrestling personalities. Brutus Beefcake, Eric Bischoff, Jimmy Hart, Jim Duggan, Brian Nobbs, etc. What the fuck? You mean Hulk Hogan has great relations with all seven of his closest, best personal friends? So do you think the criticisms that come against him are valid? Or are they just from a bunch of people pissed off that they never reached his level of popularity inside and outside of wrestling? Well, I mean, it depends on what the criticism is and who's it's com who it's coming from. And there are valid criticisms, and then there's jealous criticisms. Apparently, he and Flair love each other. Now, you know, from what now. I see on, on Twitter, <laughs> you know, but 30 years ago, I was that fucking guy. I'm still in the ring bleeding while he's already back at the fucking hotel. He's out of the shower, and he's already at the fucking bar, you know, because Flair took pride in working... 45 minutes a night and giving it his all and Hogan was eight minutes leg drop and it's a personal appearance in tights. That was the style. So the point is, yes, Hogan was the biggest star at, at of that generation of wrestling at the box office. And that's going to get a lot of jealousy. Um, and some, in some cases, rightfully in some cases, wrongfully, is it wrong that every fucking jack off wrestler in the business thought, well, I could be, Hulk Hogan with the right push. Yes, it's wrong because you couldn't be. Is it right for the elite level performers and the rest of the industry to say, well, this fucking guy is getting by because Vince give, giving him the push and he's got the look, but he can't fucking wrestle a 25% as well as I can. He can't cut the promo, whatever. Yes, that's valid too. Because there were tons of better workers in the business and a lot of better promos. But Hogan had the look and the size and the personality and, more, most importantly, the push behind him by the major promotion. So were some people justified in being jealous of Hogan making all that money and having that spot because they were a better talker or a better wrestler? Yes. Were a lot of people unjustified and 
in being jealous of Hulk Hogan because he was making a lot more money of, than them and and whether they thought that they were better wrestlers than him or not, yes, that's true also. Can you take away from the fact that he was such a huge box office attraction six or seven years in a row during the 80s as number one just because he always cut everybody else's nuts off politically and only took care of his friends? Well, depends on how you feel about it because both those things are true. He's Do you... Do you like the fact that Hulk Hogan was the face of wrestling for that 80s boom period? Or are you more upset that Hulk Hogan lies every time he opens his mouth and tells these ridiculous fucking fantasized delusional untruths about himself that aren't even necessary because he's had a remarkable enough life anyway? Sure. It just depends on what it is and who it's coming from. And there's validity to some there's not two others. And anybody that gets in that position is always going to have people saying, well, you know, fuck that guy. I could do it better. And some, you know, usually sometimes can, but don't get the chance. It just depends. Yeah. And everyone here in this list, it's a different reason. Bret Hart, it was legitimate wrestling politics. That was the yeah. reason. Yeah. He didn't want to put Bret over. He wanted to keep Bret down. Bret was a much better performer, but he didn't have the personality or the the look and the push behind him those years with honky tonk. It just, you know, <laughs> fucking honky loves to fucking, uh, uh, blister people when he doesn't like them. And I like that about honky, uh, with who else was on the list. Well, with CM Punk again, that's why I say it's different reasons with CM Punk. I think it's just his, I'm assuming his utter disgust with the man. Terry Bollea reveals himself to be every time he thinks the cameras are off. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, that's, you know, that's probably that there. I mean, everybody's got a different reason and different something to pick at. Now, and Doink, I don't know. Well, I, yeah, I don't know, because he had enough issues of his own that people could turn around and say, well, you, motherfucker. And Scott so, Steiner, I don't know, but I'd love to hear it, because I'm sure it's, a, yes. it's really amusing. <laughs> I don't care what it is. I would love to hear it. Jim, our next question was sent to cornydrivethrough at gmail.com from Jacob in Los Angeles. He sent a link here, wants to get your thoughts on Nick Densmore, a.k.a. Eugene, announcing he's going to have a retirement tour. Oh, I just saw this on the internet yesterday, I think, and love Nick Densmore to death. Couldn't fucking stand that Eugene gimmick. Thought it was an insult, and embarrassment to a great young wrestler. It especially harmed us here in OVW because I think I've told the story before. <laughs> Once a year, they'd run Nick Dinsmore's high school over in Indiana that he graduated from and actually spent some time there as a, a part-time or substitute teacher, whatever the phrase is. Every year, they'd sell 500 tickets to see Nick Dinsmore return. <laughs> the year they took him up and made him Eugene, and then he came back, and Eugene was on the card. It drew like 250 because <laughs> they... I was like, who wants to admit this guy went to our fucking high school? You know, that was the only chance that he ever got was his Eugene. So now that's the way most people remember his name. So if he's going to do one more round, I guess he's going to be Eugene. And I, so I like Nick and I hate that it came to that, but I guess that's how he has to build himself now for people outside the Kentuckiana area to know who he is. Um, you know, and say what you want about Eugene, and no one can really, in good faith, give a good explanation as to why that happened. With that said, he got over with it. Yeah. You know, I mean, I'm not excusing it, but he was a very talented guy that he did something completely radically different than anything he had done before, and he actually made it work. It's just that it was awful. Well, it, it wasn't even actually, it wasn't even awful. I mean, the gimmick at the base of it, but. At the base of what the, the gimmick is, yeah, it's awful. Yeah. yeah. The reason why it got over, they weren't smart enough to realize and capitalize on and keep going was the, the supposed idiot has to, in the end, outsmart everybody. 
that's what and and because of Nick's talent and his enthusiasm and the way he did it and blah 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 and that's the way they started that's why it got over and then as soon as they started fucking with it and he wasn't outsmarting everybody then it became bleh and then it was done and the reason why I didn't like it to begin with was because I knew it would have proper booking or not a short shelf life and how are you going to I said, regardless of however this lasts, it's not going to last too long because it's not something that's going to have a long life. But then how are you ever going to rehabilitate the person who played this part to do anything else ever again? Because he was only still in his 20s. And the answer was you couldn't. And they didn't because you can't. So and that's what happened to Nick's wrestling career. The best in-ring wrestlers we trained in OVW people either never saw or they only saw for a minute the second generation guys the amateur athletes and the guys with the bloodlines they got the opportunities and they did quite well but the actual just best in-ring performers never even got a chance to flesh out gimmicks or get more experience at a higher level or whatever because they were doomed from the start with the inanity of what they were given to to do on television. And that's, that's why all of the OVW fans, that was their biggest, it, it, without question, two to one, three to one. The biggest complaint when we would do our surveys, actual questionnaires that we'd hand out to our regular audience at the start of the night, they filled them out and they'd get a drink or whatever. Free picture. Two or three to one, it was, we hate that the WWE makes all of our favorite wrestlers look like idiots when they get on television. So that was that. So, you know, Nick, and now Nick would be, Jesus, and he's 70. He would be f about 45. So he should have had a full-time career making pretty decent money for the last 20 years. Jim? We have some more breaking news Uh oh! as we are doing the show. This is coming from WrestlingObserver.com, an article by Ethan Renner. Jeff Hardy will be hitting the road for an acoustic concert tour. The ex-WWE star has announced a series of acoustic musical performances paired with meet and greets. The tour begins Thursday, <laughs> December 16th. Paired with meatloaf. That would be great. Meatloaf and Jeff Hardy in concert. The tour begins Thursday, December 16th in Milwaukee, and will have eight dates in total. Tickets are available. He's playing the Rose... Not the Rosemont Horizon, excuse me. He's not playing the Rosemont Horizon. Rosemont, Rose Rose Illinois. Oh. <laughs> He's playing. Also, Rockford, Illinois. Des Moines, Iowa. Also, Nebraska, North Dakota, and South Dakota. He's hitting all the big spots. Well, I will wait a minute now. Hold on. Is this a... Ri this is like an Onion article, a rib tour. Where would... It's North Dakota, South Dakota, Montana. Where else would you send somebody as a rib in an Onion article? Well, he's playing some music places. Is Again, this legitimate? This is legitimate. He's uh, doing an acoustic concert tour. And I think more wrestlers should do this when they're released from WWE. Hit the road. Get a guitar. Let people hear what you have inside of you. But where do they have music in North and South Dakota? Well, yeah, he'll be playing in North Dakota and Fargo. At the TAC music venue. And in South Dakota, Sioux Falls at Biggs Sports. <laughs> and then he'll bop down to Manchester, Kentucky at Ernie Couch's place. I think my favorite venue on here is the one in Chicago, Bub City. So, but I mean, I'm glad he's doing something uh, else besides wrestling right now, but given his the issue that he just had is that the best thing to go out on the road and start traveling doing something else where you're going to be around a lot of places that potentially serve alcohol and sanction unruly behavior well if he's been unhappy in wwe for a while that's great fodder for some new songs maybe he's got some great material well, but it, go in the studio first. I'm just, I don't know. He can do whatever he wants, right? And I'm happy that if he's happy, but if there is some kind of issue and we hear from 
him and and Matt that there's not, but the WWE just said, go to rehab where we're, we're, we're releasing you. There's got to be something going on here. Do you need to just go right back out on the road with a bunch of concert dates or I don't know. It's not my week, not my week to take care of you. Here's a weird question. And I'm not saying that I hope any of this is possible. And in fact, it's probably not, but could WWE mess with him if they wanted to over the non-compete? He's doing meet and greets and a acoustic concert tour. Again, eight dates, but no. You, you, because he's competing with Elias now and Rick Boosh. <laughs> no, actually, Pete, somebody may want to hear what Jeff Hardy has to play. So in that case, it's completely different than Booger and Elias. But no, it, it, unless they want to blow their own independent contractor scam wide open, they can't because if he was under contract to the WWE it, as an independent contractor wrestler, and he decides to leave or he's released or whatever the case, and he goes out to play music or perform heart surgery or, you know, fix people's fucking carburetors. And in the process of doing that, he allows people to meet and or greet him. Well, then the only way that the WWE could have a problem with that is if they said, wait a minute, that individual, Jeff Hardy, is our employee and we can control anything he does. But their own bullshit independent contractor rule would prohibit them from doing that, would it not? Or do we need to call Steven again? I think we need to call Steven again. He loves talking about this stuff. But I think, I mean, you don't even need to be a uh, a, 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 a an attorney admitted to the bar to see that. It's a completely different endeavor. So if they say, well, we're, we want to stop our independent contractor wrestler from going out and engaging in lawn care, then there has to be a case that they are they were completely our employee and blah, 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 and all this other shit. So do you think it's more like Cat Stevens or more Simon and Garfunkel, Neil Young? What do you think the material sounds like? <laughs> what does the acoustic Jeff Hardy sound like? The acoustic Jeff Hardy, probably not. Maybe more uh, 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 Cat Stevens than uh, I don't know. I'm, uh, I'm not sure what Jeff Hardy would sound like acoustically. I'm, I'm afraid that the the cat gut that made the strings on his acoustic instruments, the sound, the songs sound like the cat was disemboweled. Well, you know, Jim, speaking of cats and speaking of cat Stevens, one thing about cat Stevens, you may have noticed any footage you've seen of him quite hairy, quite a hairy man. He was, but cat Stevens came at a time where we did not have the high quality manscaping products that we do here in the United States and around the world today. It was a, a long time ago, 50 years ago, and people just just grew all of their snatches out and just fucking braided them and went on. But now, Jesus. well, you know, you got to do what you got to do. But now we're, we can't live like savages, folks. We're in the 21st century. And for Christmas, you want slick balls and a crotch that smells good. And that's where our friends at Manscaped can help. Folks, you know that Manscaped best-selling product, of course, is the Performance Package 4.0. That's the top of every man's wish list. You've got the Lawnmower 4.0 crotch hair trimmer and with the LED light and all that stuff that's in it. That's incredible. You're going to find the, the Weed Whacker ear and nose hair trimmer. You're going to find the Crop Preserver Ball Deodorant, the Crop Reviver Ball Toner. The Manscaped Boxers, the Shed Travel Bag, that's in the Performance Package 4.0. But if you just want stocking stuffers, you've got things like the Manscaped 2-in-1 Shampoo and Conditioner, where you can kill two stenches with a single lotion and potion. You've got the Cologne-Infused Body Wash, where you can wash your body, and also you will infuse yourself with cologne. The Shears 2.0 Luxury 4-Piece Nail Kit. So whenever you're playing Sticky Finger, you won't do any of those gig jobs like they did in Texas this past weekend. The Crop Mop Ball Wipes, well, those things are good for on the go. Stick those right in your stocking. 
your intended recipient will take him out of the stocking and he'll put it in his pocket. And whenever he needs ball cleaning, boom, just reach in your, just put your hands in your pockets and clean your balls. These formulations are all vegan. We don't advise you eat any of these formations. No, do the not formula, eat any of this. Do not eat, don't no. drink the shampoo and conditioner. No. Don't eat, don't drink the body wash. Of course not. Um, I will say, honestly, the body wash on top of a Ritz cracker. No, don't even some, joke about that. Ingesting those kind of materials may that, not be good for your health. Do that, not do but, that. But they're vegan. External use only. Well, if they're, can't you, can't you rub a turnip or a radish on yourself without, I don't know what vegan people do. What do they go into cardiac shock when they eat a vegan? Cause they're vegan free or what? I don't know. But anyway, they're also these formulations cruelty free. They are not cruel. Nobody will hold you down and torture you while they put this shit on you. You put it on yourself and it feels good. They're dye free. So you won't change colors. Sulfate free. So if you don't like sulfate, you're, you're good. And paraben too, P A R A B E N. They're paraben free. They have no paraben in them whatsoever or even a single bin, much less a paraben. However, while those things are all <laughs> these, these formula, whatever the fucking paraben is, wait a minute, American heritage dictionary, paraben. I'm looking for the P's now. Hold on one second. Let me get there. Projector, pretentious, preface, practical joke, pompous, plea, pitch, phonology, pasty. We're getting close. Where's the paraben? Paraben, paraben, P-A-R-T, P-A-R-K, P-A-R, Paraguay, um, Paracelsus, Parachute, Paraben is not in this goddamn dictionary, but there's none of it in the Manscaped products either, so you don't have to worry about that. However, these products are not cost-free. They do cost something. They're not just going to give them to you, but you can save a ton of money now. Go to manscaped.com slash JCE and get 20% off and free shipping. Whether it's for your husband, your boyfriend, your partner, your dad, your brother, your friend, or a complete stranger that you just think that their nuts stink, get them something they're going to use. Be the ballsiest gift giver ever this year with products from Manscaped for the man with the penis in your life. Or if you have several penises in your life, get a bunch of these things. Well, Jim, speaking of manscaping or shaving, a lot of wrestling fans have been hoping that someone would shave down Chris Jericho's vocal cords and maybe prevent <laughs> him from being on commentary. And funny enough, God may have beaten us to the punch. Well, apparently this was this came out of London, across the pond, well, the UK. It's he's not wasn't in London, somewhere in the United Kingdom. Fozzie is on tour. Chris Jericho got sick, went to the doctor, and they ordered him not to sing. <laughs> and this stuff writes itself. I I know certain people have been critical of Chris's musical interludes, but I didn't think that we would actually get to a point where officials of a foreign government would demand that Chris Jericho quit singing. Did you? I mean, I had prayed for something like this to happen. I was something hoping like it would be someone bigger. I was hoping it would be the Pope. <laughs> but I'll take what I can get. And no, and I, I honestly, I see what was going on here. Because when I went to England the first time in, what, 2014, they took me out in that rain and miserable weather. It was in February. This is December. And uh, and I got sick and I had to go to the doctor. And I remember recalling, telling the people at the time that, their medicine over there actually works and you can get in to see a doctor just any old time you want to. And it doesn't cost you an arm and a leg. Um, but he probably got something like that and had irritation in his throat, vocal cords, and they're going to tell you don't sing or yell or whatever for a specific period of time. But since he was over there as the lead singer of Fozzie, what they did the next day at the show, they were going to have guest vocalists come up at the fans and do like karaoke or something and he was gonna i don't know stand there and hold the words up on a poster board i don't know but medically that's probably what it is but still it was 
it was good to see that somebody agrees with us and somebody with some authority ordered Jericho to quit singing. When you first heard that he was hospitalized and they quickly said non-COVID because everyone would hear Chris Jericho hospitalized and immediately yeah. think, oh, COVID, clearly he's been begging for it. When you heard that, was your first thought syphilis? Oh, come on. Come on. Now. It's taken many a man down. I didn't that my first thought. My first thought would always be the gonorrhea, not the syphilis. <laughs> Fair enough, fair enough. Or 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 maybe just, you know, a little fucking crotch rot. You never know. What do you do for that? Use cornstarch or do you use baby powder? What do you use for <laughs> crotch rot? I don't suffer from crotch rot, I'll have you know. <laughs> I thought you were Cause, talking cause from I've, experience. <laughs> I know I got I got the manscaped folks on my side. I don't <laughs> I don't suffer from crotch rot. That's from people that don't fucking take care of their, their swampy areas. Well, let's go back to what I said earlier. Speaking of rot, let's talk about audio rot. Will this do what everyone has been begging for? Will this keep Chris Jericho off commentary for a considerable period of time, if not forever? I don't think so. Because as my, if they released him after only one day, I would assume that his... If he's got bronchitis or he may be a viral infection or a strep throat or whatever, I don't think it's going to affect in a long-term basis his commentary skills or lack thereof. That's quite sad. But we can only <laughs> hope. We, we, we can still keep our fingers crossed, but um, I don't know. I don't think we, we've got a, a brief respite, but I don't expect any long-term uh vacation over this well jim another story that i don't know what you have seen and what you haven't because i know you didn't watch the event and a lot of things are shown on social media i don't know what you see but we've been hinting at it for a while and it appears that ftr and the briscoes are doing something and yes and i watched i didn't watch final battle because once again i've already lost my tre treasured and cherished tree this weekend i didn't want to see a uh, once great wrestling promotion have their final show or final in this incarnation, or let's face it, you know, the blooms off that rose. Uh, but when I heard that FTR and the Briscoes got to scuffling, I naturally searched that piece of video out. And at the end of the Briscoes match at final battle, the lights went out. Of course, Paulie, fuck. If you'd have just paid your light bill back in ECW, we wouldn't have to go through this. But the lights went out. When the lights came back on again, there was FTR standing there on the apron of the ring, stripping their laundry off, and there's the Briscoes in the ring, and they had a fucking fight. They went to Fist City. They had a Donnybrook, a stem winder. They went to town, a pull apart, everybody, referees, security guys, minions, Everybody out there trying to keep them apart. There was a few break looses, a couple of dives. That was exciting. That was two or three minutes of fucking excitement. The question is, it, it's, it's on a wrestling promotion that if it does come back, it's not going to be till April. Instead of, and, and on their pay-per-view that I would assume is probably not the biggest money piece business they've ever done. Instead of being on national television on a Wednesday night when we get to stay up late. So, is this the guys going into bed? I know, obviously, everybody's smart enough to know that Tony Khan would have to okay FTR being there in the place. But we also know that Tony lets guys a lot of times do what they want or go where they want to go or whatever. And it was you know, something that would mean something to the boys involved, so let them do it. So is, was this a sanctioned AEW angle that we're going to see some furtherance of, some result of on their program? Or was this just to give the the people watching the last Ring of Honor show a little extra taint tickle by getting them to letting them see something that exciting? Where does it go? They've shot a great angle in a wrestling promotion that now currently does not exist. And if, 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 with the way that they brought everybody else into AEW, you can't mean to tell me that the lights couldn't go out over on TNT. 
and the Briscoes show up, but we don't know whether that's going to happen. I'm interested. I want to see what's going to happen next. I don't have a lot of confidence in anybody except the two teams in this that, you know, that they'll put it together or get it right. I'm sure that the Hardly boys, as we mentioned, don't want another tag team in their own company that is stratospheres better than they are in every way because it's continuing to show them up more and more. The As we've talked about, the comedy matches, the goof-off indie shit is not getting over like it did before because now the AEW fans are seeing real talent. And so here now, not only FTR, they managed to bury and minimize and fucking sideline and make look like goofballs at the Hardly Boys' expense. That was obviously pre-planned. And then they never get in the same place again. So there's no way for FTR to get even. If the Briscoes come in and they can outwork the fucking Hardly Boys every step of the way, and they can out talk them every step of the way, and they look like actual men that would hurt you instead of children that are playing on their trampoline, that's the bad thing about having wrestlers in management. Do the Hardly Boys want another tag team? that makes them look like teetotal shit. So we'll have to find out. But FTR and the Briscoes could tear the fucking house down with a program of matches, not just a match, and then we don't do rematches, because, well, that would be too wrestling, and everybody knows we're Mark's fantasy booking in our basement. If they let those guys get on TV and shoot a nice angle and talk, and fucking interact and have some matches and build some finishes for rematches, you could have one of the great tag team programs of modern day. Or you could have the Briscoes in there the second week they were at AEW, standing around, waving their arms, turning in circles, waiting for the Lucha Brothers to figure out how to land on them, and they'd look like idiots too. So pardon me if I temper my optimism with a dose of reality. Because I'm still not sure that this can come off. All right. Well, let's get uh, going with some more questions here on the show, Jim. This next one, this is in the category of it could happen to you. I'm going to pick a random one here. <laughs> this one was sent to <laughs> this one was sent to Cordy Drive through gmail.com from Dan Fox. My question is. How come no one ever talks about how smoking hot and Gunkel was? <laughs> it's, that's the question? It could happen to you. It didn't happen to me. I was only 11. Um, it could happen I, to Ted. It did happen to Ted. At least that's the, that's the rumor. Um, I, I don't know where... Dan Fox has been, but it has been mentioned when Ann Gunkel has been brought up on numerous occasions that she was an ex-fashion model. She was quite a bit younger than Ray Gunkel, her husband. That sometimes happens in the wrestling business. And she was quite a looker in her day. And that's why that, honestly, a lot of the people who had been in and around the business for years in TNA thought that Dixie Carter reminded them of Ann Gunkel, except that Ann Gunkel's promotion was probably a little more successful than Dixie's was for a while. But yeah, you know, Ann Gunkel had the, uh, had the looks that could attract suave and deboner playboys like, uh, Ted Turner to give her some television time. So she was a very attractive young lady. And, 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 and nobody's ever said Dixie Carter for her age was not, an attractive lady. She just didn't know any more about wrestling than I know about how to program the goddamn space shuttle. So I would say Ann Gunkel being married to Ray Gunkel all those years and having all and being close friends with Renesto and et cetera, I would think she probably knew a little bit more about the wrestling business than old Dixie. All right. Well, our next question, Jim sent to Courtney drive through at gmail.com from Jason in Baltimore. With WWE's near steady decline in popularity over the past 20 years, why do they continue at this point to run large arenas in most markets for their TV tapings? 
This past Monday's Raw in St. Paul, Minnesota, had about 5,000 people in an 18,000-seat arena. Do some of these arenas have exclusive rights? I know from experience, 5,000 people in a 5,000-seat arena looks and sounds better than 5,000 and 20,000. <laughs> you are correct, sir. Yes, sir. Um, I'm not saying it's never happened that a building would in a market it, under some circumstances would have an exclusive deal with the wrestling promotion that, no, you can't go to any other building in this market. But in, in this day and age, no, that's the, it's happening because of habit. It's happening because for so long now, the WWE has booked these buildings. They want to be in the NBA arena. They want to be in the, the top arena in town uh, with very few, exceptions they feel like that it is a a pr a bad pr thing a bad look a bad impression if they're in less than the major arena i remember there was many times especially right before the attitude era where if they came to louisville they would still run the gardens instead of freedom hall matter of fact in february 96 the wwf did a pay-per-view in the louisville gardens Instead of in Freedom Hall, they sold out the gardens, you know, but that's still 14,000 less they could have gotten Freedom Hall because they weren't, they weren't on that hot streak yet where they, they had, they had been running big buildings, you know, in their own territory since the company started and since the national expansion of the eighties, but they would still especially in a market that they didn't expect to do well in, they'd go to a smaller building and follow that principle. It looks better filled up than it does versus 5,000 people in a 5,000 seat building looks better than 8,000 people in a 20,000 seat building. And it's also uh, more financially profitable to put the 5,000 in the 5,000 seat building. But then after that run in the attitude era, and the years since then, and the publicly traded company and ticket sales and the revenue from them are less important. Now it's all about the look and all about the the aura that the WWE is the premier deal. And they've also got all these relations with all these buildings now. They might not even know who the fucking building managers are in some of these secondary market smaller buildings. So they're just doing what they've been doing. And the pressure has never been less on them to make money either on house shows obviously after the pandemic that's negligible but even to make money on the live gate at tv tapings which before used to be a big deal and now in the scheme of things with the tv money is fucking catering so you know as as long as they can shoot it to where it looks okay for television and as long as they don't get an edict from either Vince McMahon or Nick Khan, who are the only two people that could probably make those decisions, and then I think Nick Khan would have to sell Vince on it, they're not going to stop running the big buildings because it makes them look less than the biggest deal. Does that make sense to you, Brian? It does, and if you remember when Monday Night Raw first started, I was at the first Raw at the Manhattan Center, which was an especially small building, but by the summertime, they started going into White Plains and, you know, running buildings WWE had not shot TV in in a long time, but you were getting 2,000 people in there making noise, and they were yeah. active. So it wasn't like the big, fancy, Ebersol look of a 1989 Superstars of Wrestling, but it looked different, and it felt different, and that worked. And also, the Mid-Hudson Civic Center in Poughkeepsie, New York, was one of my favorite places to do Raw. Not because I like Poughkeepsie, but it was a little 2,500-seat building. It was adjoined the hotel that you stayed at, so you didn't even have to fucking go outside to get from your room to the building. The locker rooms were almost non-existent. It was a couple of rooms with a bathroom, which was constantly fucking flooded, and the boys, you know, shit was everywhere, no pun intended. But it was, so it was cramped, but the, the atmosphere was in, insane. Because all those people screaming in that small, you know, space. And they did a lot of those buildings, 93, 94, even 95. You see those raws from those smaller buildings, but at least it was a jazzed up crowd. And 
there was more energy there in the Mid Hudson Civic Center in Poughkeepsie than there is in these big arenas because people ain't ain't that excited anymore. But yeah, uh, you know they've they've had a number of years to where that this is all they've done, and now the people that work there in the office, this is all they know to do until somebody tells them to do something differently. I remember when when I first got there in '96. And they started getting a little bit more talent than they could book on one show, but they hadn't been doing two live events in the same night for a while. And I was talking to Ed Cohen, who booked the buildings, and trying to say, can't can't we do spot shows like the old days, where you would go to a a high school or a college gym and cut the local sports team in on some of the proceeds and you know, and, and get these guys working at the same time. And they said, well, we, we can't make any money unless we gross. I think it was $70,000 on a fucking house show. I said, wait a minute. That's, that's renting a building and doing it like normal. If you do a spot show and the expenses are down and the blah, 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 they didn't understand anymore. Even the people working there besides Ed Cohen, how to do small spot shows and make a profit anymore. And that was 25 years ago. So imagine now if you tried to get anybody in that office in marketing or promotion or live events or anything, go to fucking Lawrenceburg, Kentucky, talk to the football coach at the high school and see if we can get a sponsor show deal. We can put 2,500 people in there and give everybody on the show a payoff and bring five or 10 grand back to the office. They, well, how the fuck are we going to do that? So there you go. On a similar wavelength, this one was sent to corny drive through at gmail.com from the stellar Justin Lopez in Brooklyn. Came upon this link from wrestling Inc. WWE is struggling to move WrestleMania tickets. And let me click this link. According to WrestlingInc.com, WWE already offering deal for free WrestleMania ticket. Ooh. Buy three, get one free ticket deal for WrestleMania in Dallas in April. Is there anything to read into them doing a promotion like this so far in advance of the event? Well, yeah, they've just figured out they got two nights in a row in a stadium in the same town. Um, Even under... And I mean, what is the, it's Texas, right? So they're a bunch of Republican Dallas. nutcases. Yeah. So they're not going to, there's not any mandates on how many people can get in the stadium, right? They're not doing like 40% or whatever capacity. I don't capacity. think so. I don't think so. No. no, Texas and Florida, they want everybody to die equally. So that's 200,000 fucking tickets. They, they hit on the great, WrestleMania thing of making it a tradition, a destination point for travelers every year, running a big stadium, having the the over the top show. That's great. But then they make those shows so fucking long. Instead of picking the people that most deserve to be on the show from a business standpoint, what seven matches can we put together that people would be most interested in? And if you want everybody to have the joy of being on WrestleMania, put them in a battle royal. That's how I got on um, as a wrestler. And be done with it. They've got to fucking give everybody the opportunity. So now they're stretching. I don't care whether they're in Dallas or New York, Los Angeles, fucking Hong Kong, whatever the biggest city in the world is these days. It's hard to fill up the same stadium in the same town twice in a row, two days in a row, much even fill it up, much less make it look good, especially with the product as cold as it is now and the ratings on the TV as low as they've ever been. So now they got a stadium two nights in a row and they've got to put people, and you know, and this was from last year, almost everybody that came for one night went for both nights. So they figure... We'll try to get the package deal and get all the people that are going to come. They're going to be here for both nights if they can afford it. I guess that's the strategy. But it doesn't look great that they're already putting the things on a sale at a discount four months out. But then again, where are they going to find 200,000 people or 100,000 people? It'll go twice. That's not easy for anybody. Maybe the Rolling Stones. 
So, so it, 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 it don't look good already if they're putting the deals out, but at the same time, they've painted themselves in this predicament by willingly renting a hundred thousand seat stadium two nights in a row. And the rock ain't going to be there. Yeah. There's very little I could think of from what we've seen from the main roster. There's very little that could really excite someone, I think, right now for WrestleMania, right? Well, it's just the idea of going to WrestleMania anymore. It's not even about the... If you get a good main event, I guess that's a bonus. That's cake. It's cake, as a friend of mine used to say. Uh, But, again, are they in the Von Erich position in Dallas? How ironic. The first year, they had a match that needed a stadium. Every year after that, they had a stadium that needed a match. And that's two different things. Well, Jim, our next question sent to corny drive through at gmail.com from Brian Muir. Hello, Mr. Cornette. Hello, I'm, Mr. Muir. I'm a huge fan of both the experience and the drive through I will keep my question brief. How was Terry Funk casted in movies like Roadhouse and Over the Top? <laughs> Did something... I think he means someone. Did someone see him as a madman and say, he's perfect? Thank you very much, and I hope to all your fellow Kentuckians, it's an absolute... Okay, he worded it wrong. He meant the right thing. He says, thank you very much, and hope to all you fellow Kentuckians, it's an absolute nightmare. But I think he's referring to the tornado. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe, you know, every once in a while on the old keyboard I had, I'd be typing shit, and I'd look up, and I'd see that half of the things that I typed didn't come out. Maybe that was his problem. Um, Terry got booked in movies specifically the Stallone movies and things like that after he got the SAG card after he did the first bit in Paradise Alley right I believe so he became friendly with Sylvester Stallone I mean Stallone was even attending he attended that show in Houston where they have all those photos yeah. of him with Bachwinkle and Harley Race and he did commentary on the show well, and, and the wrestling scenes, Paradise Alley, this was 1978 when the movie was released. The wrestling scenes were shot. I don't know where exactly they were shot, but they were shot with the crew that was in West Texas at the time, for the most part, because Tommy Gilbert was in the Tommy Gilbert taking one of his big backdrops. He was working the Amarillo territory as Johnny Starr at the time. And several of the other guys in some of the scenes were in the West Texas Territory. But the Frankie the Thumper role was, you know, was originally uh, uh, thought of for, was it originally thought of for Funk or was he was on the short list? I'm trying to remember. But they had the wrestling character in and they did a lot of casting and somehow Terry came to Stallone's knowledge and he got in that movie and that's when as a result he got a SAG card and ended up getting a variety of parts in TV and movies and different things for the next what five or six seven years and he had a relationship with Stallone that's why he yeah. appeared in over the top that was a Stallone film that's also why if you ever see Rocky five which has him and Tommy Morrison as Tommy Gunn there's a big dramatic fight in the streets at the end that was choreographed. I hate to use that word, but it's what it was. For the movie, that was choreographed, that fight by Terry Funk. Yeah. Stallone and, kept using him. Um, and, and Terry had mentioned before the respect that Stallone had for the guys in the, in the wrestling business because on the set of Paradise Alley, there were, obviously, it's a movie production. There were stuntmen there also in addition to the wrestlers, but at some point on the set, the stuntmen were giving the side eye to the wrestlers and making some comments and scoffing or whatever. And Stallone went over and said, Hey, basically you motherfuckers. I don't have to use that language. These guys do what they do in one take with people on all four sides of them. So have a little respect and shut the fuck up was the bottom line of the statement. And, and that got over with all the boys coming from Stallone. So, yeah, so that, that was how Terry got into uh, the show business, as they say, and and did a lot of the movies and TV parts and et cetera, commercials. And it didn't hurt that he was so over in Japan also. He did some 
the commercials, endorsements, things over there. He had the record album. And Terry did a lot of shit in the 80s besides wrestling. Well, you know, Jim, one of the things Terry was known for was his appetite. And one of the things he did besides wrestling was go to the Ribera Steakhouse and go to the Big Texan Steakhouse and all the different places, the Longhorn, wherever he's going to get something to eat. But perhaps he wasn't satisfied and perhaps he would be really, really proud of me right now because I somehow held off on doing this spot <laughs> until the very end, knowing how hungry I was going to be once we started talking about Omaha Steaks. Well, and besides that, I'm sure that if Terry was over there at the Ribera Steakhouse or wherever he was around the world, he was still thinking about how close that Amarillo and West Texas is to Omaha, and Omaha is the home of Omaha Steaks, and therefore, they use only the most contented cattle to make their products, folks. And as we all know, the cow must die. Broiled or fried, the cow <laughs> must die. <laughs> Right there, if you're in the cult of meat with extra cheese, you're not going to have to ask. You're going to go immediately to omahasteaks.com, folks. You have to supply the cheese, but they'll give you the meat. And right now at the holiday time, whether finding the perfect gift is tricky or finding the perfect meal is tricky, well, everybody salivates over steaks, steaks and meat and sides and desserts and all that type of stuff. And right now, if you go to omahasteaks.com, and enter the code JCE into the search bar, you can save over 50% on the perfect gift package. Here's what you get. Four bacon-wrapped filet mignons, four boneless chicken breasts, four Omaha steak burgers, four gourmet jumbo franks, four individual scalloped potatoes, four caramel apple tartlets, a jar of their signature seasoning, and... For our friends, only eight more free Omaha Steak Burgers. OmahaSteaks.com. The keyword is JCE. On the perfect gift package, you get all that $99.99. Holy jumping shitballs. Because I'm telling you what, you don't have to go out. No holiday traffic, hustle and bustle. No crowded shopping experience. Just get you some meat and some sides and either send it to your house or somebody's house that you plan to go eat at and then enjoy things afterwards. Again, $99.99 for the perfect gift package. With all of that, my God, how many pounds of jumbo meat is all? I can't even do the math. Incredible flavor, incredible value, 100% guaranteed, omahasteaks.com. The key word is JCE, 50% off, more than 50%. Ninety-nine, ninety-nine for all of that cattle byproduct and various and sundry other items delivered to your salivating throat. <laughs> is that what is salivating your throat? Well, I guess it's your salivating tongue. Your tongue is what salivates, and then the food goes down the throat. I, the only thing Omaha steaks won't do is come to your house, put this shit in your mouth, and rub your throat so you don't have to do the work of swallowing. A fine product. We encourage everyone to check it out and eat it up, as I will be doing after we are done recording. But, Jim, let's eat up a when few When the more meat is done, the toppings fly. You won't have to ask me if I want some extra meat. Omaha Steaks. Jim, speaking of extra meat, have you seen the latest with Virgil? No, but I, I understand that he's he's got a pork sticker. That'll just knock your socks off. Now, before we talk about this, let's recap this feud. <laughs> Several weeks ago, someone sent in a question about some inane statement that was put out on behalf of Virgil. We'll talk about that in a second. That he interfered in the Arn Anderson Sid Vicious scissor fight, confiscating the scissors to hand them the Brutus Beefcake to begin his life as a barber. We talked about it. We laughed we about it. We scoffed at this. Of we, course. We scoffed at this because this was obviously all in fun. Well, then several comments came out on his verified Instagram account that were just outrageous, talking about three ways with Diane von Hoffman and Debbie Combs and meat sauce and 
They're all over the place. Twin twisting Missy Hyatt's nipples like radio dials. I believe that was in there somewhere. Now, before we read the latest one, because these are humorous, I will say that. And there is some conjecture that he's either, is he doing it himself or does he have someone running his social media writing these things? That's been some conjecture. I received a couple of different emails to the corny drive through email address saying that they thought... Uh, Because I don't know if it's come out officially, but they thought it was whoever is running the Iron Sheik's Twitter account. But what a cottage industry this is. Well, now, wait wait a minute. (laughs) Where's Billy Jack Haynes? Hold on. (laughs) Now, you mean to tell me the Iron Sheik is not really saying in all those things he says on Twitter? uh, On Twitter. On Twitter, you're, you're just, you're hurting my feelings now. He may yell them out and someone transcribes it and types it. I doubt that. But... It's in the spirit of the Iron Sheik. Kind of like when um, Walt Disney died, but they kept drawing Mickey Mouse. (laughs) So the latest from Virgil here, this was after whatever we said last time. I don't even remember at this point. But here is a comment from Real Virgil. It is accompanied by a photo of you. I believe it's the photo from when you won the PWI Manager of the Year in the mid-90s. That was taken on my back deck in Morristown, Tennessee. Well, the plaque has been replaced by a photo of what appears to be an action figure of Virgil. (laughs) And here's the comment. So why is this circulating on the net? Because someone posted a pic of me. Someone posted. Oh, someone posted a pic of a pic of me in a pic that James has in his house. Maybe he doesn't know how to verbalize himself because he is truly so nervous around me. But if he followed the proper wrestling protocol, he would truly find a way to have the guts to let Bob Cottle know he offered me 13% of Smokey just to stay on my good side. (laughs) Not enough, dude. You cheaped out on me more than you did on Boo Bradley's gimmick. Everything you created was to win me over. And this is the final straw. Eddie Gilbert told me, God bless him. (laughs) That you tried to make his name Hot Beef just to piss me off. But since I got him a job with the Colognes, we let you off the hook. Oh. It also prompted Missy to taste the forbidden chocolate beef. And you want to <laughs> learn from your mistakes and offer more equity next time. <laughs> I am your beef god. And you shall pay me in 20s. <laughs> <laughs> what a sign off that is oh my god i am your beef god and you shall pay me in 20 okay we've solved one thing here. <laughs> you shall pay me in 20 it's the shall that puts it over the top <laughs> we've settled one thing it is his social media guy there's no way in the world that virgil knows who the fuck boo, Bra- boo bradley was Right. So it's got to be the social media guy, but but kudos again to the beef god. <laughs> I just want I'd like to I'd like to now see a Virgil reality TV show. Does he when he when he walks into Kroger, does he talk to the checkout people like this or does he goes in the bank to transact business? Does he take in a jar of meat sauce or what? What else is going on in his personal life? Well, the other thing is, this is obviously a funny and clever thing to do on social media, but how do you actually make money with this? Well, I don't know that they figured that out yet, but it's getting a lot of people talking. A lot of people talking about it. It certainly is, and let's get people to continue to talk as we... Wait, I, I have some breaking news here, something people are talking about. Rocky the Ramon has talked about this. Uh, we've been mentioning that this internet thing, it's all a tool of the devil to get us, you know, uh, basically reliant on this. It's really aliens from outer space that have been introduced the internet to us. Once we get completely reliant on it, they're going to take it away. We won't know what to do. We'll be easy to conquer. And then, as I mentioned, we'll all be given rim jobs to the Venusians. Well, Rocky the Ramon, you know, he's got a musical background. Apparently, Venusian rim job is an alien-themed industrial band made of all silver-painted goth chicks and thongs and electrical tape simulating analingus while they pretend to play keyboards and electronic drums to a backing track. Their hit single will be From Venus to Uranus. 
All right. Just wanted to get that in. Another fine contribution from Rocky the Ramon here on the show this week. <laughs> he knows just when to pipe in, doesn't he? Well, Jim, let's get another question here. This one was sent to Corny Drive through gmail.com from Matthew in Phoenix. Jim has been very outspoken in his views on women's wrestling. But during his time with OVW, he helped train some of the most talented and successful female wrestlers of the 2010s, including Mickey James. Victoria, Mm -hmm. and Beth Phoenix. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if Jim had any stories or memories of working with these women in OVW. Also, could Jim elaborate on what his training philosophy was when working with female wrestlers and what he thinks it takes to be a top girl in the business? Jesus Christ, an essay question. Um... Well, first well of all, thought out question. I yes, think it was very well and, thought and out. I think where he, where he was going, I thought where he was going with it was, well, you trained all these great, or helped train all these great female wrestlers. Why don't you like women's wrestling? And as I've said, I don't dislike women's wrestling. I dislike bad women's wrestling. Even more than I dislike bad men's wrestling because the bad women are even worse than the bad men. But as I've mentioned, when you have talented female wrestlers whether it be as he mentioned mickey james and beth phoenix and and uh who else did he mention there in that in victoria, victoria. Who was a standout or when you've got in tna i've loved working with gail kim and awesome kong when they were having their series or i've enjoyed as a fan watching charlotte and rhea ripley and a few other people interact with them the problem has become that for whatever reason, everybody decided a few years ago that there has to be the same number of men's matches and women's matches on a show, or else why is it's not fair and it's not equal? It's also not good, because as we've mentioned, there's a shortage of really high-quality, experienced, working talent in this business to begin with, but there's more good guys than there is good girls. That's just the way it is. And so when you, instead of taking women's wrestling and making it an an attraction on the card that people would want to go to see, it's a destination for, for people who like women's wrestling to see that match amongst those top girls. Now you got four of them on the card, nothing stands out and you've diluted your talent pool because as I've mentioned, there's more good guy wrestlers than there is good girl wrestlers. It's always going to be that way. Sorry. Can't change fucking biology, history, or fucking common sense. So that's it's just all watered down now to where that's all you see. And you come out of interviews with girls to matches with girls, to more matches with girls to interviews with girls. And I'm sorry, but... <laughs> It took Dana White a while to have any female fights in the UFC. Then he found an attraction. And now they have them, but it ain't half the fucking card for the same reason. It's just because wrestling is a work and the people that are orchestrating it are fucking milksops that are afraid to be chastised for not giving everyone a fair and equal chance. Everybody can't play. Not everybody can be a pro basketball player. Not everybody can be an astronaut or a double knot spy. So <laughs> I'm not again. And then we don't even need to go into the predilection of some people, especially in one particular company, for thinking that every Japanese citizen born with a uterus is a great professional wrestler. Because everybody said, why don't you like the Japanese girls? I have liked some Japanese girls in the past, the ones that were good. I just don't like the outlaw mud show girls any more than I do the ones over here. So as far as stories from training, we had a women's division in OVW that consisted of the Ladies that were put under contract and sent here to train, which at various points was Jillian Hall and Alexis Lurie at that point was Mickey James and I always like that Beth name. Phoenix. I have to say well, I always liked the name Alexis Lurie. 
I did too, better than Mickey James, because then you're thinking, well, is he a member of the Monkees or who is me? You know, but anyway. So we had them and we had a number of girls that wanted to try to get contracts and came in on their own, and that was enough to make an opponent for all the contract girls. And every once in a while, we'd have a tag match, but it would be a feature attraction on the show, not half the show. And everybody prospered. And to make sure that the really good females got plenty of experience and doing a variety of things, I also involved them in the groups or factions. The heels, Nikita was with uh, uh, the revolution of Doug Basham and Conway and Damage. And so at one time, uh, was Jackie Gaeta. Uh, they, their strong point was not in-ring wrestling. Their strong point was his personalities. But we also had Jillian Hall or Mickey James be uh, involved in the babyface OVW Originals group so that they could second and be involved with the main event talent. Everybody got personal attention. Everybody prospered. And I didn't have 18 girls out there that all looked the same doing the same shit and working green. I had girls that we could concentrate on so everybody could tell them apart. Everybody knew their name. Everybody knew what they looked like. And everybody knew whether they were a baby face or a heel. And that was more beneficial to them than it would have been to a group of 25 girls that only four or five or six of them were going to be of that caliber anyway. What was the rest of the question? Well, I'm, I'm curious. You talked a lot about the guys. We brought up Johnny Jeter earlier, the guys who had a lot of talent, a lot of potential, and it didn't work out, and it may not have been their fault. Are there any examples from the women? I can't think of one that you've cited, a woman who, like, oh, my God, this person is such a talent. She's got it. She's going to be a big star, and it didn't work out. Um, I think Nikita could have been as a as – a, she her – her talent was not going to be in being a, a premier in-ring wrestler. She could wrestle and she trained to wrestle. And a, a lot of time over the last six months or so that she had a contract, she was injured. She'd had a, oh God, what was it? Some kind of rib or abdominal muscle injury and couldn't really train, work out or do much. But she had great camera presence and she could be the attraction at ringside. The valet, so to speak. Um. Most of the time, when the girls came, they came, as I mentioned, with contracts, so they had a vested interest in getting them on television in one way or another, and there were fewer of them, so most of them got a chance, but there was there was a few girls that came in on their own on a local basis that were just as good as, better than girls that you would see on TV today, but it was just, there was not as many spots then. And also, to be quite honest, the, the field was a little bit stiffer with girls that really had, because those girls had come from either independent wrestling before it just got insane, or they'd been able to work a couple of years, closing of a couple of territories. They had a little bit of wrestling experience in the late 90s, early 2000s. Now, you have to go to these indies and just hope or whatever it's you know or you're taken under your, somebody's wing that has a lot of experience in the business so a lot of the girls just come in thinking this is the way i get to reality television or the real housewives or i get to be on tv and wear clothes they're not getting in the wrestling business they don't have any frame of reference all right, and Jim, what will be more than likely our final question... Yeah, think! ...was sent on Twitter using a hashtag corny drive through from Corey Illingworth. Hello, Brian and Jim. The Sportster compiled a list of nine wrestling cliches that should be done away with. And I wanted to get Jim's thoughts on whether or not he agreed. And I have a who, are, who is the Sportster? The, uh, I don't know who, who told this sportster guy that he knew what nine things needed to be done away with. Well, I have the article here. The author is Cameron Miller. Nine wrestling cliches that need to go away while fans are used to certain things when it comes to wrestling. The following cliches could go away and very few people would miss them. Okay. Number nine, contract signings. <laughs> 
Well, since we see one so often now, again, you know, I don't know how old this guy is. Maybe he's 25 or 30, and he's never actually seen it done right. When you have one every year or so for the biggest match that people are going to see and shit takes place, that draws money. When you have one for every Tom's Dick is Harry match every week or two on TV and the same shit always happens, they need to go. Okay, number eight, bumps that knock out referees. When do they do those anymore? Watching two of the greatest wrestlers of all time put on an absolute classic for a half hour can be a joy. But when a referee is taken out by a simple kick or a dull punch, many fans end up groaning. Things are only made worse when the referee stays down on the canvas for a ludicrous length of time. Fans are watching world-class athletes throw the hardest-hitting and most complex moves at their opponents. And while the referees aren't competitors, they are grown adults who should be able to take a little bit of punishment without falling into a short coma. <laughs> oh, that that's good. That's very good. Um, <laughs> that is good. Well, yes, that's what we've said. If it looks bad, then it needs to be taken out regardless. A referee bump every once in a while in the finish, if you want to draw some money and sell some tickets, you should. You should do that finish every great once in a while, and it needs to look good with the right people involved. And then the referee doesn't see whatever went on, and that's the reason for your rematch. I don't know that AEW, I think Tony Khan a while back said, well, we don't bump the referee here. Well, they did fucking last week for a minute or whatever but you no know, it's another thing that unfortunately used to when it was done by professionals when it was called for by professionals and done in a sparing fashion drew money and now because nobody knows how to do any of those things you got marks on the internet writing that it ought to be abolished well i can already tell Everything on this list should absolutely be done in wrestling at the right time and by the right people, and it'd draw a ton of money. But everything also on this list for so long has been overdone and looked like shit by people who didn't know how to do it, that it all needs to be on the list. So there you go. What's next? Number seven. Once again, this is the list of the nine biggest cliches that wrestling could do away with. Number seven, a big man enters a battle royal. To be fair, what the fuck? There always is something exciting about it. <laughs> there always is something. There needs to be a weight limit and a size limit on the battle royal. Nobody too big now. That wouldn't be fair. To be fair, there's all. I can't read this. There always is something exciting about watching a Goliath enter into a battle royal. You think? The downside is that it's incredibly rare for a big man to win a battle royal style match especially when it's something with a lot of stakes, like the Royal Rumble. The issue that many wrestling fans have with that is just how much the commentators sell the arrival of a colossal competitor. They may seem like a big deal, they may even eliminate people in impressive fashion, but the chances of them actually winning are pretty slim. Again, because everybody involved in the business is an idiot. Um, Andre the Giant made a career for the most of the 70s of traveling from town to town just to win the Battle Royal. Even if he didn't work in the territory, unless there was somebody else in it like Dusty in Florida or whatever, Andre would win the Battle Royal because it made sense, and that's what people came to see. However, it, it, most Battle Royals these days, and they were never a lot of fun, but if work was put into him, like the Los Angeles Battle Royal, the San Francisco Cow Palace Battle Royal, etc., those were exciting and those drew money. Battle Royals everywhere originally drew money and then were done and overdone and prostituted, and and the boys never liked being in them because they're difficult and it's dangerous and people all around you. And they were shits enough that people stopped coming just because it was a battle royal. And then Pat Patterson twisted and made the Royal Rumble, and, you know, that was good for a while. But, again, it it it, it makes a difference of, the, of who your giant is. 
Giant Gonzalez could have won battle royals for fucking six years every night. He wasn't going to get over because he was the shits, poor fella. He didn't know what he was doing, and, and it, it didn't work. But you could take a guy like Andre or Big Show, more modern or whatever the fuck's what they're trying to do with old almost. Now he's almost ready. But it it depends on the place, how the battle royal is structured, how often people have seen battle royals, and who the giant is. You can't make a blanket statement. And they should never try to do it in AEW because they've already had enough battle royals in their first two years to last for 10. Number six, Evil Foreigners. Oh, the, for fuck's sake. The overdone and occasionally offensive stereotypes that can come with the evil foreigner cliche is something that a lot of wrestling fans have been done with for a long time. While there's nothing wrong with telling a hometown hero story, the idea of having a story feature a foreign villain that's mostly only a bad guy because they aren't American isn't great. Those stories have been done well in the past, but those are often with larger-than-life characters when compared to the typically more grounded characters of the modern era of wrestling. So the guy's saying just what I said. They used to do it right, but now they don't do it anymore because nobody's interesting. The biggest draws in the history of wrestling on the heel side were foreign menaces, all the way from the terrible Turk in the 19-teens to the Sheik when he was the biggest drawing heel in the wrestling business to Hans Schmidt when he was the first major national German heel five years after World War II, and he's on the Dumont Network, he was making the equivalent of a million dollars a year in today's money. I could go on and on, but it has to be good talent, and it has to be the right fucking people that they're fucking with. But everybody always hates an outsider or a foreigner or someone who's different than they are when they are fighting Someone that you like or that is like you or that you support or that is a hometown or home country hero. And anything from the the, the Canada-U.S. thing with Bret Hart and Shawn Michaels it was a very odd way of doing this, but still uh, someone from another country or another state or another sports team, another fucking college, those fucking assholes from the U.K., not the United Kingdom, from the University of Kentucky. Every time they come play the University of Louisville, they're fucking foreigners. They're from 60 miles down the road, and we don't like those fucking Wildcats. It, it, it doesn't CM Punk matter. and MJF. CM Punk and MJF. It, 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 somebody has to be from somewhere else. Somebody has to be different. Somebody has to be not like the guy we like, and somebody has to be the antagonist. And so, yeah, we need more foreign heel. Whoever we're mad at, whether it was the Iron Sheik with the, in the 80s and 90s, the Gulf War, whatever the fuck, whoever we're mad at is easy to make a heel out of, but it doesn't have to be a different race or a different country. It just needs to be the opposing team in some respect. And it, it, Texas hates Oklahoma and vice versa in a sports rivalry. That doesn't mean the people are going to meet at fucking that state line down below Lawton and just go to slugging each other. But when an Oklahoma team comes into Texas, they're the fucking heels because they're the outsiders. Same fucking thing. Number five, cameras don't exist unless they need to. There is something strange about two wrestlers having an intimate or intense standoff backstage only to never acknowledge the fact that there is likely an entire <laughs> team of people present to record the interaction. Many wrestling fans find it to be a little bit odd. Things are only made more confusing for the viewer when on the same show a wrestler interacts with one of the crew members. Yes. Whether that be by accident or on purpose, there are a lot of wrestling fans who enjoy the drama but don't want to be treated like they are watching a daytime soap opera. That one I'll agree with wholeheartedly, and that's something that did you ever once in professional wrestling on any television program see 
until what, 15 years ago, see a camera backstage, behind the scenes somewhere, shooting wrestlers, and they acted like there was no camera there at all? Did you ever no, see that? Never, no. No, that's a new thing. It's not wrestling. It's sports entertainment. That's a I Vince agree. thing. That's a WWE thing. It's a Vince thing. thing. Yeah. That's and also Vince. That Vince didn't like him to look at the camera. That's why when they're doing backstage interviews and the, there's an interviewer standing there and asks him a question, there's no people there. There's a camera standing there. So they're looking around. They're looking at their shoes. They're looking up in the air. They're wa wandering around. They don't want to look at the camera because they're told not to. It's the stupidest thing in the world. There's a television camera in front of you and your statement is either telling your opponent or your fans something. So you look directly in the camera and make the eye contact with them because when the people look into your eyes on television and see that you believe what you're saying, they believe you. And that's taken, not that any of the guys could probably pull it off anyway, make them believe it if they're looking in their eyes, but still that's, and that's what Vince, even in the nineties, they were telling Kevin Dunham, how him not to look at the camera. Why? That's what he's talking to. You fucking little fucking ferret. Anyway, it drives me crazy. Number four, poor distractions. A distraction in the middle of a match can easily heighten the drama, but that's when they're well done. Some classic examples of what many fans consider to be bad examples are things like a beautiful woman simply existing at ringside, <laughs> or, <laughs> what, are you going to say something? And and they jump up on the apron, and you turn around, and you've never seen a woman before. You just got out of solitary confinement, 25 years in prison, and you're mesmerized, and your feet turn into fucking quicksand, and you can't move. Or a potential future contender sitting at ringside. While it makes sense for wrestlers to always be aware of potential attacks, being distracted by a woman because she's attractive in the middle of the match in which you're trying to destroy your opponent can make wrestling hard to bear. This guy's not too wrong on any of this stuff. He's so far. not too bad so far. It just, he's not old enough to have perspective. They still think that this is an old time wrestling thing, which it's not any of these things. It's just modern wrestling. With this, yes. It, <laughs> Again, the WWF style of doing things and what Rip Rogers calls as seen on TV, when you see people that are on TV in a job you want to have doing something, you naturally think that's the right thing to do and start doing it. And that's why as seen on TV has ruined the wrestling business. But distractions, yes, if they're realistically done, but when people turn and stop and are gobsmacked and slack jawed at something that's happening and then just stand there mesmerized for seconds on end without reacting to anything because they're trying to sell it. That's fucking rotten. The I've talked about the, when the heels are getting heat on the guy in the ring, boom, boom, boom. And somebody's going to come out to save and their music plays and the heels stop and look the guys at least 80 feet. Right? They can still kick the shit out of the guy they're kept, but they stop and look when they hear the music, even before they see the guy coming to save. All that's overacted, and they're putting more entertainment into it than believability, and that's where everything looks like gaga. It, it, if you're trying to get away with a crime, chances are you're going to be in a hurry. And And a lot of people are not paying attention to that basic rule of thumb. Go ahead. Number three, everything under the ring. <laughs> for years, plenty of wrestling fans have wondered exactly why there are so many strange objects for wrestlers to find under the ring. While some general objects like chairs, tables, and ladders can make some semblance of sense, yeah. things like guitars, trash cans, and the occasional stop sign absolutely do not. <laughs> <laughs> there are a lot of wrestling fans who are purists of the art form and believe that weapons should stay outside of most promotions except for the rare occasion. Those people tend to agree that whenever a wrestler reaches under the ring, they are likely to pull out something ridiculous. Yeah. Many people are left wondering why WWE has so many kendo sticks under the ring. Because, again, everybody turned into a bunch of fucking marks 
and thinks that's what wrestling is because they saw it in the Attitude Era. Kendo sticks. Uh, it, if, a ja if a Japanese wrestler wants to use a kendo stick, that's fine. If a guy from Cleveland wants to use a kendo stick, it doesn't make a goddamn lick of sense, does it? But anyway, yes, I agree with this also. And you can ask wrestlers in Ring of Honor. You can definitely ask them at OVW. We didn't have to fucking even go over this in Smoky Mountain Wrestling because everybody was a veteran and the thing never came up. But I have actually had to explain to guys in Ring of Honor, no, you can't use blank. Why not? Why would it be under the ring? What about that, that object or that implement that you want to utilize? Why would that be under a wrestling ring? Is it a toolbox or something that would be kept in a toolbox for maintenance on the ring? Is it an extra table for the announcers and timekeeper? Is it an extra chair for the security that sits at ringside? Is it an extra turnbuckle? Is it, is it an extra board that goes under the ring? But what justification can you come up with why that would be there except it's fake and I put it there because I want to use it? Because if that's the only one you got, you can't use that fucking object. There's plenty of other things that you can use that would be in and around the periphery of a wrestling ring. Figure it out. And that's what we did. Fire extinguisher is one of my favorite ones. The Briscoes and Chris Hero and Claudio, they got a fucking huge pop in Toronto one time with a fire extinguisher because Toronto, I don't know if you're aware of this, but Toronto has not seen a lot of good old-fashioned Southern wrestling because they're in Toronto. And I bet may have been the first time they saw the fire extinguisher spot, but that would be under a wrestling ring, wouldn't it? But a kendo stick, 18 tables? A ridiculous amount of chairs, um, some of the other spurious objects that we've seen pulled out. No, it's ridiculous. And that tells people this is fake and that was put under there for the reason to be used, not this guy's lost control of himself and found the nearest blunt instrument he could pick up. That's the, the impression you're going for, not it's fake. Number two. Everyone is down. <laughs> there is definitely a case to be made for fans showing their respect to two performers while they take a quick breather after a sequence that took everything out of them. But that's something that isn't always earned. A moment like this can be a marvelous spectacle when done well, but it's not used all that well all that often. Two wrestlers being unable to stand after a brutal exchange in the late stages of a long match can make a lot of sense, especially when it's a hot rivalry. When a few wrestlers are having a random televised match with no buildup, that moment where no one can stand just feels cheap and cliche to many fans. Well, I, I don't know what he's describing here. If it's a double knockout, that can happen in any match to anybody. Boom, and they both go down, and then somebody comes up, maybe the momentum changes, whatever. If they're laying there like Michaels used to with ever, whoever his opponent was to milk the people to get them rumbling so he can do his nip up and the people ain't particularly in the mood to rumble, then that's that's a different thing altogether. But I don't think we ought to wipe out all... I'll, I'll tell you what we ought to take out. That fucking stupid bullshit where a match just breaks down, whether it's a tag match or a six-man or an eight-man or whatever it is, and everybody just runs in and takes turns doing their big move to a guy. And as soon as that happens and another guy runs in, does his big move to another guy and on and on. And the referee just standing there watching. And by the time that they finish doing five or six big moves and everybody's laid out and somebody's finally done a dive, you forget where they've tried to take you with the entire rest of the match. Who'd they get the heat on? Who made a comeback? We don't remember. Because we saw all this fucking mess. And you'll pop while it's in front of you because it's moves being done, but they've just negated all of the progress they made building the match from the time the bell first rang to get to a point where you want to see something happen. And then it's just bing, 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 all these fucking moves and everybody running in and out, and you lose track of everything that's been done. It's just a fucking, it's just showbiz. It's just a mess. Well, the number one cliche that could be done away with, according to the Sportster, the Spanish announce table. 
<laughs> and this one, I'm sure you could understand without me reading their uh, description yes, here. But, yes. But I agree with you. What you just pointed out is one of the big cliches that has to go away. The, I can't believe it, Ruby Soho fake, that person kicked out look. That yeah. has to go away. I hate that. There's a lot well, of cliches. The, the, you know, the Spanish announce table just started because Vince liked to rib Hugo. And then and then it it went from there. And then it became a a thing where people in the Attitude Era started bringing signs about the Spanish announce table. And I think they even put an announce table in one of the fucking action figure toys. where So you can go through the announce table. But the reason why it was always the Spanish announce table is because in... The, and this is before they'd even figured out how to gimmick the, the announce desks. But they would just go through them, but they couldn't take the chance of knocking the actual English language broadcast off the air on pay-per-view in those days. That would have been a goddamn disaster, and it would have cost a lot of money and blah, blah, blah. But they didn't care whether the second audio track got knocked off if that happened. So they said, don't break our the premier announce table, break the Spanish announce table. And then they just started doing that enough to where it became a thing, and then Vince started getting tickled by it. Were there a lot of interactions between Vince and Hugo Savinovich? Um, on brief occasion. <laughs> uh, especially poor, poor Hugo had a, a bad period in his life quite a while back and made some news in Stamford for being in a place he shouldn't have been and doing things he shouldn't have been. And that's when he got released from up there. And I'm sure there was a conversation there, but, but most of the time, no, in, in the, in the production meetings, the poor Spanish announced team just sat over in the corner and cause they knew nobody knew what the fuck they were saying. Nobody in those days gave a shit. I don't even know if anybody was listening. They could have been out there saying the most, they could have been telling the aristocrats joke in Spanish. We wouldn't have known. Nobody gave a shit. And, you know, it just, it's, it's grown since then. Now the, at WrestleMania, um, where they, well, well, no, what was the, the show in, in, uh, with Slapco? It was Saudi Arabia where they had Slapco Fud and Fubar Makafakaloob as part of one of the 18 different language announced teams they had. It was just, it was just poor Hugo. And what was his Carlos Cabrera back then? English and Spanish was all you got. And they didn't give a fuck whether the Spanish got knocked off the air or not. Cause who's listening to it? Almost nobody in those days. This has been nine wrestling cliches that we don't mind getting rid of. <laughs> but Jim, with that, I have some breaking news. Let's end with the breaking news instead of, uh, okay. Music today, because a new report has suggested that a peculiar and potentially dangerous situation unfolded at AEW events in Long Island when a fan posed as a wrestler and made it to the locker room. Are you serious? This is on right now. ITR Inside the Ropes is the company over there in England. ITRWrestling.com. I don't know if they credit another. Oh, Fightful Select is reporting this, and they are re-reporting it. An incident took place backstage. The report say, states that the building security at UBS Arena let a fan who was posing as an extra backstage. A job guy is basically what he was apparently masquerading as. The report states that building security let him in. The fan then took the bold step of entering the inner sanctum of the professional wrestler, the locker room where he unwittingly took up residence in Dax Harwood's chair. <laughs> the fan was promptly told to move before relocating to Blade's chair. <laughs> Remember Blade of the Butcher and Blade fame. It is reported that questions were soon asked of the fan as suspicions were aroused as he was putting on what was described as Jeff Hardy style armband. <laughs> the fan was then asked who trained him before naming Hardy as his wrestling coach, which came as a surprise to the wrestlers present as Jeff Hardy does not train wrestlers. <clears throat> the fan is then reported to have given the wrong name when asked who booked him as an extra. And it was at this point that MJF and Dax Harwood seemingly decided enough was enough and threw him out. 
they are said to have taken him to someone who was able to confirm that the same fan had been kicked out of an AEW show in Boston in October. In Boston? Wow. So the, and this this has happened before where guy some fucking schlub would just walk in the back, tell security he's a wrestler, be carrying a wrestling bag or whatever, and try to do this. But it, now I guess it's more difficult than ever to determine who the wrestlers are from who the fans are by looks alone since they all look the same and in some cases the fans look a little tougher than the wrestlers these days but apparently thankfully dax and mjf who have wits about them and and know what the fuck they're doing were able to figure out this no oh, hold on this guy but yeah, he just walks in, carrying a bag, sits down, starts putting on his Jeff Hardy armbands in the AEW locker room. Hey, everybody gets an opportunity. Everybody can play. He took it seriously. Do you know not only how difficult it would have been for anybody to do that in the territory days, almost impossible, but what would they would have they would have had a more exciting exit from the locker room than being taken to somebody who could tell that they were full of shit and asked to leave. I'll say that. I was back in the back in the Louisville gardens in 1978 when Don Fargo had gotten there late. It was his first week back in the territory and he was late. He was riding by himself and he's beating on the back door of the gardens. The, the fucking Andy Frayne usher wouldn't let Don Fargo in. And he said, look at me. And he had a fucking inch and a half long gig mark across his cheek and a fucking black eye. And carrying. And he said, look at me. You think I'm not a fucking wrestler? And I heard it and had to go and vouch for Don Fargo to get in the fucking building. If, the, if anybody made it past security and got in the locker room instantly, the boys would have known it was bullshit, even if it was job guys at a TV taping you knew most everybody or the job guys that came knew everybody. And that guy would have got the teetotal shit kicked out of him. But now I guess you can't really, you can't tell the players without a program, Brian. Well, let's just be happy that for once there was a fan incident that no one was attacked or anything happened. It was just someone who wanted to pretend he was looking for work. Huh? No, he wanted to pretend he had work. And that's what I'm upset about. Nobody was attacked. That was the first sign that someone realized something was wrong. They said, yeah, like, we need more extras. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think somebody ought to dotted his I and crossed his T before they let him out. But that's just me. Anyway. Well, with that, the drive through has closed. The very popular... Thumb piano or kalimba, as it is properly known. We'll, of course, be back next week here on the drive through and this weekend on the Jim Cornette Experience, wherever you find your favorite podcast. Some omnibuses coming later this month and to the YouTube channel. Get ready for that. Of course, you can access classic episodes of the drive through and the experience by becoming a patron. Patreon.com slash Cornette. For $5 a month, you get access to the archives going back to the beginning in 2013 patreon.com slash cornet and all you patrons sit tight more episodes about to be uploaded patreon.com slash cornet you can of course subscribe to the official jim cornet youtube channel over 265,000 strong on our march to a million full episodes clips of episodes omnibus collections and so much more the official jim cornet youtube channel you can follow jim on twitter at the jim cornet you can follow me on Twitter at Great Brian Last. You can hear me on the 605 Super Podcast at 605pod.com or available wherever you find your favorite podcasts. And don't forget about Cornet's collectibles at jimcornet.com. Don't forget about it, but just put it away for a while, right? <laughs> just, just put it in the back of your mind for a little while while I get some rest at jimcornet.com. The drive through is brought to you by the Law Office of Stephen P. New, 888-692-8084. Get even with Stephen at newlawoffice.com. But until this weekend on The Experience, 
And next week, right back here on the drive-thru, for Jim Cornette, I'm the great Brian Last. Tally-ho! Tally-ho!